No Jumper, coolest podcast in the world. And today, I'm talking to somebody who is so controversial in the streets that he had to sort of disguise himself coming in the sort of. Is that so? I didn't know I had controversy around me. Well, I mean, you, you want to hide your face. I mean, true, true. My face is out there, though. It can be found. It is. Yeah. yeah. You're it, just trying to minimize the damage? No, nah, just trying not to be recognizable, really. You want to be known for your ideas and not your. Basically, pretty much. Right. I don't want to have a situation like you where people are like, yo, Adam. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted that so bad. And then it kind of happened. And it was like, oh, shit. Like, <laughs> I can't get that back. Okay. Yeah, that that's makes the sense. thing. Because it's like you could always open it up later. Yeah. But once it's open, it's like you can't just close the box back up. It's true. It's good that you know that because I feel like most people or a large percentage of people think that, like, getting famous would be the best thing that could happen to them. Yeah. And it's it's like a weird thing where I feel like most people couldn't understand that it comes with a lot of negative stuff. I feel like I was a little bit self-aware enough to know that fame could negatively impact my ego. Mm. For example, like I feel like maybe a lot of people, they got a lot of confidence after being famous or whatever, no. or a cloud or money. I was always kind of like cocky. So I knew like I wouldn't be able to handle fame in that respect. And I've seen, like I've watched a lot of internet. I've studied people. I've seen people like FouseyTube that I used to watch like lose his mind many times over. Was he one of your first YouTube heroes? Nah, Mr. Shy City. Who's that? He's like OG YouTube, like this black dude in Chicago. He was just hilarious. He would show cameras like on the other side. Uh -huh. So he would show like his perspective and he would just crack a bunch of jokes. He's OG YouTube. We're talking like the same days as uh, Philip DeFranco, right. Timothy De La Ghetto. He was that era. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Because Fusi actually did play an important role for me because he was like one of the first vloggers that I ever saw. Yeah. And I realized like, oh, this guy is losing his mind. He's not stable. He's having a fucking breakdown on camera. People are watching him cry and just like get into these crazy like bouts of depression and like, you know, he gets super fat and then he loses 50 pounds and he's super skinny and it's just like he's just bouncing around. He's like so blatantly unhappy. And I remember like sitting at home watching it thinking like I have my life together like a million times more than this fucking dude. But, you know, and I, I thought it was so badass and so crazy that he was paying 15 grand a month for uh, his apartment. I remember it was like this big house that had like four bedrooms. I was like, bro, you live by yourself. But it was like a high rise apartment type thing. Yeah. Yes. Where like he could have got like for that amount of money, you can get a sick ass place in the valley where you have a backyard and a pool and you could get fresh air and all this shit. And instead he's just in this like glass chamber. Yeah. I remember because I used to watch I used to watch his vlogs every day because it was like a story. I watched it to, to try to figure out how the fuck this was possible. That's what I was trying to figure out in my head. And then to actually kind of be part of the eventual dissolution of everything that was going on by going to FusiCon, which he was not at and documenting it that was insane i remember watching that and the live stream he was on a live stream with you guys kind of going crazy about that, that, that too. too when he showed up and screamed in fucking uh sam pepper's face yeah that damn. was the best that brings back i mean it's crazy how ice poseidon revived sam pepper's career at that point in time that was a whole nother era of the internet sam pepper managed to like revive his career a couple times but i feel like he sort of like dirtied his name to such an extent with all the crypto stuff and the NFTs. Yeah. There's a lot of people that it's like going to be hard for them to reestablish their fan base because they just became NFT guys for I feel a while. Like people, certain people just get away with it. Like no, Logan Paul just, it just, he just got away with it. Yeah. Tory Lanez, I feel like any rapper just gets away with it. A Tory, lot. Yeah. I Tory mean, Tory Lanez had this coin that it, he was pushing like crazy. Mm -hmm. I talked about it a bunch of times. That yeah. boost coin. Yep. And that thing is disappeared even the six nine shit he's like biggest rapper at that well not biggest rapper he's a huge name he puts out a fucking blatant scam crypto thing and that's not even to say anything about the gene shit which i'm sure that that storyline is still unfolding unfolding but i mean yeah like even like uzi at one point had a story up about some coin and i heard that he got paid like a million dollars and he deleted it right away it was like eternal demons or something like yeah. that but it, the people who got in early, I'm sure Soldier Boy made millions of dollars off NFT promotion. Lil Xan was one of the earliest on that wave. Really? Yeah. He was the first Twitter that I saw that his feed was just straight NFT posts. I was like, what the hell is... No, it wasn't... It was before NFTs. It yeah. was coin posts. Yeah. So it was a bunch of different shit coins or whatever. Can we curse on here? Yeah. All right, cool. 
it was a bunch of different shit coins and i was like what the hell is this this guy's whole feed is just full of this right and then a bunch of rappers started hopping on it, and then it was like you know lil yachty and all of these other rappers right and i feel like rappers get more leeway to get away with this shit right and at the end of the day they're not i feel like people are like yo there's more of a get that bag mentality within hip hop. Yeah. Whereas other genres, they may perhaps. There's a lot of casual fans in rap. Like, I'm going to compare subculture wise. I have a friend who is a poker pro, and it's like the fans of poker tend to be very smart very analytical and they could see through the bullshit right so at one point he has a sponsor and the sponsor basically has him post about slots you know like in the casino it's like an online slots thing whatever he posts about it it's like a unanimous negative reaction from his fan base because the fan base on average knows that slots are bullshit it's a scam and that it's a totally idiotic thing to put money into and that it's a disingenuous cosign because he's not the kind of guy who would ever spend his time playing slots right whereas in rap it's like the average like Lil Uzi Vert has potentially enough fans that some percentage of them could move the needle crypto wise but it's also like I mean how many casual fans are taking the time to like put money into a coin base so that they can buy some and isn't it more complicated than that with a lot of these shit coins because they're not listed on the main exchanges? It's it's a pain in the ass. It is insane to think that this was a real thing. The NFT thing, it just it's just hard to believe that so many people made so much money. I was on the phone with Waka Flocka, him telling me, he goes, you are going to make so much money off NFTs that you're not even going to have to do this podcast shit anymore. And I remember just thinking like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and sure enough, I did not make any significant amount of money off you it. You had just bought one, right? You I didn't... bought a CryptoPunk. Okay. Which has I... lost some value since we bought it, but But it hasn't like tanked like crazy, has it? Nah, I think the CryptoPunks and like the board apes, I guess. There's like a few of them that are still holding some some decent value. When it comes to poker, it, are they more like, hey, this is our craft. This don't package us in with people that are doing gambling and slots and roulette? Or is it they have no issue being kind of conflated because it feels like a different game. I'm not yeah. too up on poker at all. Be, well, poker is very much like a game of strategy. There's a lot of luck involved in it, but it's a lot of skill involved in it, you know? And it's like the people who play it, they emphasize the, they, they attempt to minimize the gambling aspect and try to emphasize the the skill factor, you know? So when they see him doing an ad for the slots thing, and it's just obvious that he doesn't actually do this. But I mean, at the same time, that's hypocritical kind of because, not hypocritical, but it's it's kind of like a silly standard to hold him to because it's like, clearly he's posting about this bullshit for money, right? Like when I do the ads on this podcast, nobody, nobody thinks I'm fucking sports betting, right? Um, Maybe, d- I don't know. I mean, some people might think that, sure. Yeah. But I don't. You know, it's, it's cats out of the bag. Like I do ads for shit that I don't use. Like who the fuck cares? It's just like I I feel like my audience gets it. And that's kind of, like I heard Ice Poseidon make that same argument with why he's taking all this money to do these crypto scams or whatever is like, you know, it's like are you really that fucking stupid? You really <laughs> like <laughs> Are, I feel like that's different though because you're not doing a no jumper coin. Like for example, yeah. you're like, "Hey, this there's a sports betting company, they sponsor me." You're not saying, "Hey, this is our brand. This is what you guys watch. Yeah. This is what you guys mess with, and we're doing a coin." And then you're like, "Hey guys, you should have you should have known better." Yeah, because there's a big difference and this is something I realized with Selena Powell, there's a big difference between doing something like me having her on the show a bunch of times over the years nobody really it was never that controversial then i like gave her her own show and let her do a couple episodes and that was what was really controversial and i feel like same thing i could promote 50 fucking scam coins on here and it's not going to be that big a deal it'd be kind of a big deal now because people actually get it you know but if we like rewind the clock two years I could do 50 fucking shitcoin promotions and then just kind of stop doing it and people will kind of move on, whatever. But meanwhile, if I do one no jumper coin and it's and it's bullshit, I'm being held directly responsible for sure. Yeah. But you knew that Selena Powell thing was going to be a train wreck. There's no way you didn't know. I felt like I could control it. Mm. I didn't get a chance because it got so crazy so quickly. Because remember the second episode, the first episode that I wasn't on, I think I'm getting the order right. It might have been the third episode. But either way, it was like the one I wasn't on. All of a sudden, they have Slim Danger, Chief Keeps Baby Mama, on there. And she's talking about fucking whatever redacted football player eating her stinky ass and making her not shower for three days. Like it, It got so crazy so fast. I didn't see that coming. 
I thought I would have time to mold it. Yeah. And were you still doing them live at that time? Yes. <laughs> I was oh. sitting in the other room for that Slim Danger one, like kind of hearing it in the other room and like being like, oh, this, this could be a problem. Do you still have in the back of your mind potentially like a no jumper, a girl's style podcast? Or is that something you just don't really consider? Because I saw Joe Budden do it or try to do it. And I thought it's a big, bold ask. You see your analytics to think that yeah. it's going to translate over. I think it's kind of like the ultimate thing if you could pull it off. Because when you think about Caller Daddy and Barstool, it's like that allowed them to have millions of people coming to their platform basically consistently so they could sell advertising to people that they never would normally be able to sell advertising to because now they have this big, amazing girl show, you know? And, like, for us, like, if we had Call Her Daddy, our subscriber growth would probably be ridiculous because we'd be bringing in so many people to No Jumper that would never go near it normally, and there's a lot of money to be made from all these different niches and everything like that. But, yeah, it's like how do you do girl content when there's, like – you know, it's like my, the guy audience, like who are the girls that the guys are going to listen to? Like, I feel like it is possible because I feel like we would want to do one where maybe you have like an OnlyFans girl, but then you also have a girl that's like not on that at all. You know, you'd have to I, and I feel like you would kind of have to have a guy there. I feel like you would have to have like a bunch of different types of people. You'd have to have a guy there because I don't think guys like a guy audience is going to like really gravitate towards an all girl podcast. I think that the Joe Budden podcast you're talking about, if one of those had Maul on it and one of them had Rory on it, yeah. I think that they could have actually been successful. And I think you saw that when like they had Rory as one of the guests on one of the episodes, boom, they get a lot of views because you know, like the Joe Budden fans didn't necessarily know who these chicks really were that well and they, you know, it's like the guys guys don't listen to podcasts from girls. Yeah. And I feel like kind of vice versa as well. And I think it's the same thing with rap, too. Like, we're seeing a lot more successful female rappers. But I think a notion that isn't getting talked about enough is certain guys will be like, yeah, you know, these female rappers are hard. But if you ask them, okay, let me see what you've listened to in the past week, right. very few of it will be female rap. AD will be, oh, City Girl's hard. Yeah, Meg hard. You look at his fucking music he listens to, he doesn't listen to girls. Like, I mean, it's just not... It's it's tough to find a girl that like actually like hits the the things that guys want to hear a chick rap about. I'll, I'm not gonna lie to you, Glorilla hits more of those boxes for me than almost all the other girls we've seen come out in recent memory. I feel like Doja Cat hits everything. Yeah, but she's like a pop star, so that's kind of yeah. But she raps a lot too. I feel like mm. it's people are a little bit dismissive of her because I don't listen to her ability. catalog. I just hear the singles on the radio, right? Yeah, no, she can rap well, but I feel like Doja Cat kind of takes a great because she's one of my favorite artists right now. But and nobody I, throws her the conversation of, like, Nikki Cardi. Like, she's not in the queen of hip-hop conversation, right? Even true. though she maybe should be at some point. But I think that's because she doesn't try to push her foot towards it. Yeah, she's yeah, not she, declaring herself a, a combatant in this world. Exactly. Yeah. I like Glorilla because she's not – the emphasis on her is not her appearance. And that's yep. one thing that I feel like female rappers have always had it difficult mm -hmm. is if you're not an attractive female rapper – then you're just not going to succeed. Whereas yeah. if you're a male rapper, it doesn't really matter what you look like. Right. You can make it. Yeah, definitely. Like with Glorilla, it's like she's good looking enough that it's not really a conversation that much, you know? Like she's not she's not the super hot chick. No offense, Glorilla, I love you. But it's like people don't talk about her like Meg, where for a while I was like, Meg, her big natural ass or curves like people were really kind of infatuated with her at a certain point you know glorilla is not like sexy enough for people to talk about her like that and she's not like gross people don't talk about her like they talk about lizzo yeah or uh chica for instance she was a great rapper i thought she was an excellent rapper right. but the focus was on her appearance yeah like for example like glorilla i'm not i'm not commenting on her appearance but i'm just saying it's great that when people talk about Glorilla, you know they're talking about the music. Yeah. When people would talk, like, for example, this used to be a huge thing. Everyone was like, Georgia Smith. All guys would talk about Georgia Smith. But they would never talk about the music. Right. They would just talk about, oh, how great, good looking she is. Yeah. I'm like, okay, what are some good songs? And they're like, yeah. what songs? Yeah, we haven't really seen the, like, really, truly unattractive female rapper be able to do it, right? Like, yeah. who's the example? I don't know. I don't want to shit on her. Yeah, right. Like but like, but meanwhile, parents. there's plenty of dude rappers who are like objectively pretty fucking ugly and they put on a bunch of nice clothes and everybody forgets. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Guys can do that. 
and Gr- the thing girls is, don't though, always get to do that. The thing is, they can't blame it on guys because the majority of female rap listeners are females. So it's the female audience that doesn't want to listen to and let's say less than attractive female rapper. But we know how women listen to rap, and like women tend to be like the most passive consumers of rap. They True. like catchy songs. They they listen to the radio. They're not the ones who are going to dig for the underground artist or really like care that much about lyrics and stuff like that. I mean, hip hop in, in its entirety doesn't seem to really care about that that much. But it, it is weird because pe- you'll hear people have these conversations, and I, I, I would love to hear your thoughts on this. But it feels like a lot of times people will be like, "Girls are taking over," and it's like, "Who?" Like you're talking about like a couple of chicks who have a couple of popular songs. It doesn't really feel like it's that real right no they're not taking over. but <laughs> i feel like they're being pushed forward more yeah and i feel like now for example i feel like girls that listen to hip-hop were limited mm. they're like oh we can only listen to these few rappers now it's opened up a little bit more although like let's say city girls city girls are not known for their music at all jt is now known for being uzi's girlfriend and the other girl young miami she's now known for being with Diddy, having her own reality show, stuff like that. So r- musically, they're not really talked about as much. I'm bl- basically totally blind to their music. AD always tells me that they play it in the club a lot. They do. I'm not really like even sure exactly what they sound like. I've listened to it a little bit, and it really made almost no impression on me. I've heard the song that Lil Yachty wrote. That's it. Mm. So Weedy, for instance, she had a couple of songs that were going crazy in the club. I don't know what she's doing. She's kind of... Completely out of the conversation of music. A bunch of the girls who were really being pushed hard a couple of years ago, like Sweetie and Mulatto and shit, that you just, it feels like maybe the industry sort of stopped pumping money Mulatto, into their career I at a certain she's point. She's doing good. You think she, she is. Yeah. She okay. actually had a good, um, she had a song with Lil Wayne. A friend of mine told me to listen to it. It's called, like, I think it's Sunshine or something. She's, she's actually pretty good. I listened to her album, right. 777. She's got some talent, but she's also a female rapper that kind of moves off of the image as well yeah she compliments it with the music so i have to give her credit for that but other than that i mean i don't even really i don't know i haven't gotten a gauge if women enjoy ice spice yet yeah the ice spice thing i kind of feel bad for her because it's a lot like the coil array thing where there's like a seed of potential there's like a, a cool song or a cool tiktok at the very least and then as soon as that that little bit of them becoming a star pops up, they just get put under the most intense microscope where if Ice Spice drops a single and it doesn't hit like the way that the few have already, it's just going to be perceived as like such a massive L. Whereas like, you know, during Pooh Shiesty's rise, he definitely put out singles that maybe didn't hit the same way that certain ones did. And it wasn't viewed as this like catastrophic blow to their career. But you see how every time she, there's already been multiple viral clips of like, look at her rolling loud and she's kind of awkward on stage or look at her at this club and people aren't really looking at her and shit. You know, it's, she gets put under this crazy microscope and she's clearly not that developed as an artist, right? She's not. And I think it's different from Coyle Ray because Coyle Ray, she kind of had a build up. Like people were yeah. a little bit familiarized with her. She I interviewed her way before build. she was popping. I interviewed, yeah, I interviewed her Rolling Loud like 2018 or some shit. Yeah, Ice Spice is kind of like boom out of here. Like I asked a question on uh, Twitter the other day and I was like, oh, is Ice Spice Munch the new CJ Whoopty? Mm. Because CJ had Whoopty, it went. He's, I don't know what he's doing now. But I feel like people genuinely like Munch and they like her. And with CJ, it was kind of like, ah, here's this hot song from this guy that the people genuinely don't really like. But I think people enjoyed the whole Whoopty song. I don't know if they enjoy the whole Munch song. Because let's just say you've heard it. How many views do you think the music video has right now on YouTube? Munch. Yeah. 20 million. 10 million. I checked like yesterday. It's like at 10. Yeah. So I think it's not that out of there. I think it's one of those songs that people hear the snippet and they don't feel compelled to check it out. Yeah. Where, and I think that song is one of those TikTok hits because you see it in the live performance where people are freaking out about that one part and they feel kind of lost for the rest of the song. Yeah. And that's kind of the danger. Like she's having a lot of success now. I saw this one clip. I think she posted it earlier today where she was rapping a verse uh-huh. from, I don't know if it was an upcoming song. And it wasn't bad, it was actually a little bit better. But she's in a position where if the next song doesn't hit, and she's also in this position where her team is probably like, we don't want to release music. Some Munch remix is supposed to come out. Mm. So they hold her back. Her catalog is like three songs. Right. 
So by the time they do this whole year or so of munch, people are like, okay, we're done. We're, right. we're munched out. So, okay, I remember back 2016, 2017, 2018, when you really kind of have the SoundCloud wave popping. Like, at that time, you could really kind of feel the concerted effort by the industry and the media, et cetera, to basically, like, push forward women rapping and you know push forward you know gay people rapping and stuff like that but then meanwhile you look at the stuff that's actually really popping it's toxic it's x it's six nine it's fucking pump it's little xan it's all these dudes who are basically like not even aware of like woke shit or at the very least like don't give a fuck at all now it's kind of like a different world because you have a lot of these these girls being pushed as like the next wave of of rap but then you don't really have this like compelling counter narrative from all these sort of like toxic masculinity rappers because there's just not that many popping dude rappers you have you know like drill music and, and and pockets of like street music in a bunch of different cities and there's artists who come out that are popular but it's not like there's just this like wave this tidal wave of fucking new dudes coming out so it's kind of like ah we sort of have to pay attention to these chicks because there's not that many dudes who are really popping off it's kind of like the manosphere Almost sort of like I I, I kind of believe this. I feel like podcasting in a lot of ways is almost like the reason why you see fewer male rappers popping off. Because even somebody like me, when I get in the car, I'm usually listening to a podcast and usually not thinking like who's the new rapper that I'm going to be listening to. And I think that's an underrated factor. Mm, so you think a lot of peop people are opting to listen to podcasts more than Perhaps male audience is probably opting. That's a possibility. The average dude that I know, and granted, my perception is kind of skewed because I'm in the media and a lot of people that I talk to are, you know, infatuated with hip hop media. But a huge percentage of people that I know will listen to a three hour Trap Lore Ross video or they'll be subscribed to you and they watch fucking a video from you every couple of days or whatever. And then meanwhile, like they're just not even bothering to check out the new Kodak Black record or whatever, you know? And I kind of fit into that category too, where it's like, I'll watch a fucking Kodak uh, interview on million dollars worth of game the day it comes out. And then the new Kodak album or the most recent album, it took me a couple months to even listen to it and start to, never mind to listen to it like five, six times and start to like be like, oh, I, I like this song, this song, and this song. I'm going to listen to those songs when I work out or whatever. It's like, I don't know. It, it does. It feels like a lot of people's mental energy is kind of going more towards YouTube and podcasting rather than just listening to rap all the time. You think that's a bit of an age thing too? Like for me personally, as yeah. I've gotten a little bit older, I'm not, I'm just not excited to like hey i can't wait till this album comes out like for example i like tory lanes mm -hmm. he dropped an album i don't know sometime a couple of days ago i'm not in any rush to listen to that i have a bunch of other stuff to do i'll get to it when i get to it right but also for example uh baba lamb he had he was like he went on like a little rant at his audience because he was upset that people were showing him like this five second snippet he's like dude i don't give a damn about no five second snippet from a song that hasn't come out i'm like 26 years old I, I don't care about this anymore. Yeah. And I feel like podcasts are something where you know what you're going to get. It's a level of entertainment. You can kind of passively listen to it. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, it's way more difficult now, I feel like, to find the music that you want to hear. It's like if there was music that you're like, I would love to hear this, you would have to go out of your way to search and dig to find it. Mm. Whereas it was easier back then, 2015, 16, 17, but now industry is forcing so much stuff down. It's like, oh, I go to Spotify, I go to Apple Music, I go to YouTube, and I'm getting hit with the same artists over and over again. Right. I'm like, yo, I'm tired of these artists. Can you show me somebody that's a little bit different? Right. Because I know the artists are out there. It's just now it's so much more difficult for us as the consumer, especially if we don't have time like a teenager to just keep looking through music to actually find them. Right. But even a teenager, it's like if they're given the choice between, you know, watching a fucking, you know, when I go to Spotify, a lot of times it's like rap caviar and academics podcast or Joe Rogan's podcast. The only, because I think the only podcast I've subscribed to on Spotify are Ack and Joe Rogan and then Spotify or a uh, rap caviar might be the only playlist I've subscribed to or whatever. So I have to make that choice. And when I look at rap caviar, the emotions that I go through in my brain are like, this is going to be boring. It's going to be stale. It's going to be something. It's going to be a lot of songs I already heard. It's going to be some new songs from some artists that I'm already kind of burnt out on. It's going to feel corporate. It's going to feel like a bunch of shit that the labels want me to listen to. 
it's just very different than the way that I felt in 2016 where there was like new artists coming out all the time that felt like they were really worth listening to, you know? And whereas on the other hand, if you click on, and even for young kids, I think this is true, is that if you click on a Joe Rogan podcast, it's like, you're going to hear some fucking doctor telling you about ivermectin, or you're going to hear, you know, some athlete talking about whatever. It's like, it. I mean, it makes sense to me that a lot of people are just skewing themselves towards podcasts. I don't know. I feel like videos too. Like, for example, he just got- And they have video on, the, the, when I'm saying podcasts, I mean, they have yeah. video for both of those podcasts on Spotify too. Yeah, yeah. For streams, like, for example, like, the especially certain collaborative streams like when like he just got banned today but Sneeko, destiny yeah. all those people on like a panel that's something i'd much rather watch because it's kind of a huge clash of different personalities yeah and they're able to actually talk to each other without just a bunch of yelling mm -hmm. and that entertains me more so than just like oh another song right yeah like haven't seen a ton of big rappers coming out in recent memory but meanwhile like andrew tate has a Nelk Boys interview that got 10 million views. You know, like that's just that says a lot. The fact that fresh and the rise of fresh and fit, the rise of the manosphere, the rise of all this shit. And I think that those communities are kind of at risk of like burning out and ceasing to be relevant in a lot of ways too, just because you know, it's just like there's like a shelf life on how much of these conversations people can really be willing to tolerate, right? There's no adaptation to because mm -hmm. for instance. I think Andrew Tate was a fluid individual where he could conversate with a bunch of different people. Yeah. Whereas Joe Rogan as well, he's basically, he's inviting you. He's like, oh, you can talk. Even if he disagrees, he'll allow the person to keep, keep going. Joe Rogan isn't there with like, hey, this is the ideology and I'm going to impart this on you. Mm. Fresh and Fit, for instance, they're lock hard. Hey, this is the ideology. This is the truth that we believe is the truth. Right. We're... This is what we're propagating every day. And whoever comes here, this is like this brick wall. You're either going to agree or you're going to run into this brick wall and i think some people get tired of that because they're like man can you at least entertain the possibility right. of a perspective that may be different from yours and that's why i think you're seeing destiny explode right now like he you know i think that there was like a point where like vosh and like uh you know uh, hassan and all them were like surging past him like crazy and now it's like he's really kind of like getting big in like you know there was a period of time where it felt like he was sort of falling behind and now he's getting way bigger because he's really willing to like platform dissident beliefs and he's kind of branded himself as being the dude who's willing to go to fresh and fit and not be a dick and sit there and basically tell them that he disagrees with them but in such a way that he doesn't alienate the people who are diehard fans you know for, for me yeah like I'll, I, I respect Fresh and Fit. I like them as, as people and everything. But when I click on that shit and I just hear them having the same fucking conversation for the five millionth time of like, well, guys are like this and girls are like this. It's like, yeah, I get it. <laughs> like, yeah. I just, I don't need to hear this anymore. And there's a nonstop flow of girls, though, who don't get it and will sit there and say the dumbest shit imaginable to their faces just because they don't really understand what the fuck is being talked about so it's like they they have like a, a consistent stream of girls willing to have these dumbass conversations but for me i, I need something new if i'm gonna be listening to podcasts yeah, it's also and shit. logistically impressive that yes. they're able to get that flow and stream of new yes. chicks consistently it's it's mind-boggling i think when i went there they had 14 girls on the show that's also a mess. If you have 14 people <laughs> yeah. in a room, you can't expect people to not talk over each other. Yeah. It's kind of like when there's a party and they're like, oh, everyone, uh, you know, keep your voice down. There, if there's 150 people in here, people could be whispering. It's going to be loud. That's why it pissed me off when Myron got so much shit for telling Asian Doll to be quiet. Yeah. It's like, bro, that scenario where you have that many girls, you just cannot afford to just be letting people have side conversations. You kind of have to be a dictator as the podcast provider. Cause I've, I, and, and you always get a rep for being a dick. Cause I've had to do it 5 million times. You have to stop talking over there. You have to be like, no side conversations. You have to be like, stop banging the table, which I don't really have to say anymore. You know, there's like, there's a million things that just end Are up talking to the mic saying that like 50 times. Yeah. It sucks. Oh yeah. Take me through the, the, your YouTube journey and how you landed on making videos about smoke prep, not selling much. That's not how I started, but that, that is one of one of the things I've kind of come to. You excel know. it, yeah. That's your bread and butter. But uh, how, how did it start? Uh, and what year did it start? 2017, beginning of 2017. So around March. That's I think that's the first video I dropped. That uh, was? Yeah. I guess. Oh, okay. I didn't realize that no, was no, the... No, no, no. That was the first, the first video I dropped. I think it was a Lil Yachty video. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I, I had been following hip-hop all my life, and I was on like a bunch of different forums and stuff like that. I used to talk a bunch of shit. 
uh, I used to troll, all that. And I saw people doing YouTube. I saw your channel. I, I remember watching it from the first rap interview because I was an Xavier Wolf fan. Mm. And I saw that first interview, and then I saw you had Ian Connor, who I found who I found Xavier Wolf through previously. Okay. And then I kind of got introduced to more people, but like the cast that you had around that time, and I would just follow No Jumper. At this time, Academics was really the only guy. It was Academics Dom is live, mm. and then I thought, well, there's nobody really covering certain more topical conversations within hip hop. Like for example, Lil Dicky was kind of blowing up during that time. Right. And it was kind of like comedy rap, which is a little bit what Young Gravy does right now. And Ugly God kind of was maybe like one of the early people. So I wanted to cover more topics like that. And I found a little bit of a lane. So I said I could co cover more of these rappers that you were covering because I watched them a lot. And even the ones before they got to know Jumper. So I started making videos about that. I knew I was, I dropped out of school. I was majoring like math and physics. I was like, dude, fuck this. Mm. I had this, I was sitting in class one day. And you, you're from Brooklyn? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I was majoring, I was majoring in this boring stuff. I was good at it, but then I thought, okay, what's going to happen? If I do good at this, which I'm paying money for, mm -hmm. or my parents are paying money for, and I felt guilty about, even though it was relatively cheap, I'm going to get a job and it's going to be worse than the school that I already dislike. So I was like, okay, I have to do something about this. So uh, I told my parents I was going to school, which I technically was. I would go to the library. Right. And I would just work on videos, read different books, look, look into a bunch of, like, marketing stuff, consistently just post. And at that time, I had been trying to do YouTube since 2015 in terms of just getting a channel. But I wanted to do, like, more filming type stuff. And I would tell a bunch of friends, and they're like, dude... YouTube's done if you didn't get into it <laughs> back then. Right. You're not going to make it now. Yeah. And I'm like, all right, fuck this. I'm going to do this myself. So 2017 comes around. I didn't have anyone to film. So I said, okay, I'm not going to film. I'm just going to record voiceovers. And funny story, the early videos are such trash quality audio. Really? Because So I had bought the Blue Snowball mic, which isn't like a terrible mic. And I plugged it into my Mac, my MacBook, and I had... So but I would record on QuickTime Player, and I didn't realize that you had to select the actual microphone. So for several <laughs> months, I was recording on the on the default MacBook right. microphone. Talking into the mic, but the mic's not picking you up. Yeah, it was it was terrible. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah, so then uh, I but, was like— You know, Ak, Ak, that's one thing I realized listening to him is that he has always taken his sound incredibly serious, which I didn't realize. that I wouldn't have thought that. But like over the years, he's 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 really into the mic quality. I feel like except on stream, I feel like I'm getting blasted on stream. Yeah, I don't know. Microphone quality. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe. Maybe I'm totally lying. But Fine. I feel like I heard him say something that totally made me think that. In videos, yes. Okay. But stream, the the microphone has always been like ear, oh, really? especially when he's yelling. Oh, okay. It's like piercing. Yeah. Because you can even hear it when he's like, oh, my favorite rapper is Drake, Drake, and it's like so loud. I guess you're right. Yeah. When I'm watching that, that seems like it's a different audio quality. Okay, but so you you just saw you saw the opening. It was the combination of I see a hole in the market where there's some stuff that isn't necessarily being covered. But what what was that your thought process on that? Because like if I were to be a YouTuber thinking about starting a channel at that time, you're looking at Act, you're looking at Dumb is Live. You're like all this stuff seems like it's kind of being covered. Like what what did you see as like the gaps that you could fill? I just knew personality wise I was different. Like right. for example, I know Act is a great entertainer. I'm not willing to be that entertaining. Mm. I feel like our personalities are very different. You're more so factual. I, yeah, I feel like I, I come from that background. And I wanted to approach music and hip-hop more so from like the marketing perspective, the PR perspective, the packaging of the artist, as opposed to just music. Because mm. I don't really do music reviews because it's something subjective. Yeah. Like if someone's like, yo, this Pusha T song sucks, and I say it's good, we're just going to be batting heads forever. Right. Like I really respect Anthony Fantano's content. Because I don't think I could do that. Like, it, it, I, I watch it and I'm kind of in awe. But the idea of like having to listen to an album a couple times and then like put together this 10 minute compilation of my thoughts, like, I find that kind of overwhelming. Yeah, it feels like homework. I'm like, yeah, I like this album. Wait, now I have to explain to <laughs> yeah. you why I liked it in depth. <laughs> right. Oh my goodness. Like, shoot me. <laughs> I already have a hard time really like enjoying music because of my job. But I feel like that would 100% kill it for me. Yeah. And that's something that nobody was actually doing. Like looking at it like, hey, maybe you like this guy, 
not so much for the music, but a lot of these other things surrounding the music right. that he has in the package, which is kind of like what Jaleel is right now. Like, I talk about, I don't think I've actually done a video on him, but I think Jaleel has the full package except the music right now. Mm. I think his music, like, he has a song or two, but his music is not, I feel like it's lower, a tier lower than mid, <laughs> but he's got the image. He's very brand friendly. Yeah. Think about, Think about a clean 50 cent in 2003. Like, he's got that image. He could have bodybuilding, protein powder, yeah. you know, sponsorships. Because I've, I've known him for, like, five years or some shit. He used to always come through the store and stuff. And he was doing backflips back then, Damn. taking his shirt off, buff as fuck. And it's it's interesting. Like, he's he's been working at it. And, yeah, but I wonder, too. I'm like, is this just a thing where people like him or is his music popular? Popular. I think Very the music hard for me can to pick up because one thing that I noticed, especially when he's at Rolling Loud, he's a relatively small rapper. Right. But when he's at Rolling Loud, you can see the crowds, even at the smaller stages, he's getting the crowds to get really amped up and right. go crazy. And a lot of them probably don't know who he is. So if he's able to captivate a crowd, I feel like that's the best marketing nowadays if you have a crowd going crazy. Well, you contrast music. that with the average rapper who basically makes no attempt at getting the audience pumped up. Were you ever into punk and hardcore or metal or anything? Uh, more like pop punk. Okay. Because I, I just, I grew up going to a lot of those shows. Like I was listening to rap and I was listening to hardcore and metal and stuff too, but I was going to hardcore and metal shows. I really didn't go to like rap shows until I got way older. But that was always like one super clear thing to me is that like this music live is incredible and rap live is not incredible on average. Yeah, I just went to a show the other day. It was in New York. It was um, a, f a friend of mine. He manages this girl, uh, Killboy. But she was opening up for Swaco. Mm. And Lil Aaron was performing too, I think. Oh, was this This was in the city? Yes. Yeah, this this is New literally York. at the venue that we did our live podcast at. But it was that show was two days before our show. Yeah, I was going to go venue. to that podcast. I literally flew out the night before you guys were doing that podcast. Wow. And Danny Lay performed at that venue the day I in between. I saw that she was supposed to perform there. And there was a little Aaron sticker in the toilet. <laughs> like, inside the toilet. So, like, yeah, but they I figured on... he had probably been there recently. Yeah, yeah, he was definitely there. Yeah. He put on a good performance, though. Right. So, I, I saw Swaco, and he started off as a rapper, and then he made that transition, and he was, it was a great performance, the live music was good. They remembered their lyrics. There wasn't a backtrack playing. And I also went to a System of a Down show earlier this year. And it really made me just not want to go to rap shows at <laughs> all because there's almost zero effort put right. into this. Yeah. And I think that's also why... Uh, who was that rapper that had a show that, was, <laughs> that sold like 60 tickets and then he canceled it? And then he went on IG and said, I'm not... I'm not going to the show. It got canceled because we only sold 50 tickets. Was it Summers or Autumn or... I think it was Autumn. Someone in that orbit. Yeah, so he said that, and then people were saying that he sold 700 the previous time. Oh. That's what they were alleging. Wow. And then when I thought about that, I thought, okay, perhaps that was your first time performing in Atlanta. Uh -huh. You have a bunch of fans. There's no doubt that this guy's a ton of fans that listen to his music, at least online, and speak about him. Right. They had maybe had never seen you before. Yeah. So they're like, okay, Autumn's coming. We love his music. Let's go see him live. Right. They go see you. There's that new factor. Right. The show sucks, or it's not memorable. I'm not sure. But if it's not memorable, or it sucks, and it's a lazy performance, like, yo, we enjoy your music better when we're listening to it on our headphones, right. they're probably just not going to come back. Or they got enough autumn for the rest of their life. They're like, hey, I went to a show, I saw them, why would right. I ever go back? Because I'm like that, with going to see artists. I mean, like, there's a lot of artists I'll go see one time, and then to go a second time? Like, unless there's something different happening or you're performing with other artists or whatever, it's like, you better really make a fucking impression on me if you're going to want me to go see you over and over. That's my honestly what I was thinking after doing the live podcast. It's like, okay, we sold 400, 500 tickets for the show. If we come back and do this city again in a year, are we going to do more tickets? Are we going to do the same tickets? What percentage of them are going to be the same people? Like, what do you have to bring to a live show to sort of make people become these devoted, dedicated fans? Because it's very easy for me to understand why people go see metal and hardcore bands over and over. And a lot of the biggest metal and hardcore bands are bands that have been doing it for 10 years over and over and over. This kind of music where you listen to it and it's very complex and intricate and you have to like study the fucking lyrics if you want to sing along. There's like a real high barrier of entry. And 
and there's a big emphasis put on the live performance of like everybody perf- like even just performing with a singer, a guitarist, a bassist, and the drummer, and they're all so in sync. And when you see a good fucking metal band versus a bad metal band live, like it stands out like night and day. Like sometimes you'll see a band that you love their their album and you see them live and it sounds like shit. And sometimes you see a band that you don't even give a fuck, but they're so good live that it'll make you really like respect them so much. And then in comparison, a lot of rappers, yeah, they put in the smallest amount of effort. And then meanwhile, like there's been a lot of artists over the years that get a lot of points for their live performance. I remember when Yellow Wolf first, he was like the star of South by Southwest one year, just because he was performing without a backing track. He would rap super intricately, super on point, on beat, and the fucking journalist basically declared him to be like the winner of South by Southwest this year. And but I mean, how many artists bring that level of attention to it? Yeah, it's very None. few. Barely and any. I also feel like a lot of artists they pinch pennies when it comes to the Mm. production on the show. Right. So if you just have your DJ, you, you're playing the track, they're looking at it like, hey, I'm getting booked for this much. This is how much I'm going to make. They're not willing to spend a lot. And if they make it a crazy experience, for example, Travis Scott. I saw Travis Scott on tour twice in the same night in 2015. It was the rodeo tour. Mm -hmm. It was him and Young Thug. And at this point in time, I listened to Travis, but I was more so there for Young Thug. Mm. I was like huge, huge into the Young Thug at the time, his music. And the performance by Young Thug was whack. Really? But yeah, it wasn't It wasn't good. He was still learning and all of that. But Travis Scott came on and he just killed it. The production value is crazy. He had like fire coming out. And this was Webster Hall. Right. So it was a relatively small venue. And he probably broke even or lost money on that show. Mm. But after that show, it made me say, like, yo, this is an experience that you don't want to miss. And I don't want to miss the next one mm. that he does. And Travis Scott is one of those artists that spends a ton on production. And it's paid off. He got the reputation for having these crazy shows. Playboy Cardi spends a ton on production, too. I wouldn't necessarily call him a great performer. I always go back and forth with people about this. What, what do you think about Playboy Cardi as of late and his performances as well as his music? Well, I have been documented on this channel as basically being kind of unimpressed with his uh more recent shit you know like i i just didn't really i listened to a whole lot of red i'm like you know cool like this is not for me you know and then it became like the biggest record in the world i think that that album more so than almost any other album in recent memory to me really sort of symbolized like oh you are kind of out of step with these kids these days because to me i didn't really find it that cool or interesting and clearly like a whole generation of kids did so i you know and i can accept that when that does happen because if i had listened to it and i loved it i would be on the podcast saying that i loved it and there's been a lot of times that i listened to music where it clearly wasn't for me but i still got it but even that right there is like if maybe if i had taken more time with that album and listened to it a few more times and not felt the need to talk about it online immediately after maybe i could have like been a little bit more open-minded like maybe the rush to have opinions about it online kind of killed it for me you were, you were a fan of it absolutely not oh, okay. i called it like one of the worst <laughs> things that i had listened to that year yeah it was it was i couldn't stand it but the thing was that i feel like that album it attracted a ton of people because it was happening during the same era as like hyper pop was going on. Yeah. So I think it attracted a lot of those fans because when I see the majority of Playboy Cardi fans or stands now and just the way that they kind of talk on the internet, I'm like, these guys are not originally from the hip hop sphere. Mm. They're kind of like a little bit outside and they got dragged into Playboy Cardi specifically. So for the most hip hop fans, even like people that liked older Cardi, because I loved self-titled mm. great album. I enjoyed it so much. Dial it. I was not really a fan of. I like self-titled more, but a whole lot of red. I just couldn't. I can't listen to it again. Mm. And I think that's what he did. I don't consider him a great performer. I think people just like the environment of going to his shows. I do think he puts production value into it. Right. But to call him a great performer is insane to compare him to just even a Travis Scott or a it's pretty low effort a J. Cole or somebody yeah. that's actually putting in crazy amounts of effort. He's just screeching into a mic. Right. And then lets people do whatever the hell they want. The thing with Cardi is that to me, I, I do think that like musically he's continued to keep his fans on the hook. You know, like they, he definitely continues to do interesting things and to keep them interested for sure. But I feel like everything else surrounding him as an artist is very well done. Like he's really just created this this aura of cool around himself. He's just managed to be rare 
in situations where like almost no artists from that generation were, you know, like if you look at somebody like Lil Yachty, I mean, Lil Yachty and Playboy Cardi really came from like the same class essentially. But with Yachty, it's like he will hop on a record with anyone. He will, he's put out fucking 10 albums in the time that it's taken Cardi to put out like two, right? I mean, maybe not 10, but a lot. You know, he's experimented with a ton of different sounds. He's he's really like, you know, he's done commercial records. He's done, he's done like a million different things. He's done a million interviews. He's like, you'll, you know, whatever. He's just done everything. And like Cardi in comparison has just managed to really keep his fans just wanting more where like the every tweet is just tantalizing to them, you know? Like he's, he, he really is like a real artist in that sense. He's like really kind of shut himself off from a lot of the things that rappers do. And I and I think that that's got a big amount of, that's got like a lot of importance in terms of why he's managed to like cultivate this this audience. Yeah, I think it's partially, uh, partially his own doing, but I also think it's because who he was associating himself with when he first got on. Because True. at that time, 2014, was maybe when I first heard of Playboy Card. He was like young Zanho era, before Broke Boy. Ian Connor was rolling with him. And right. back then, like Ian Connor was like that cool guy on the internet. Right. That all these the young demographic loved. And he kept Playboy Cardi. He was the mouthpiece for Playboy Cardi. Right. And he was like, yo, you just roll around with me. He was kind of Ian Connor's sidekick for a while. Oh, definitely. And his, his shooter, basically. He's beating <laughs> yeah. the fuck out of uh, Kerwin for him. Yeah, exactly. So then that happens, and then he links up with ASAP Rocky. And then ASAP Rocky is ASAP Rocky. Mm-hmm. Like ASAP, they had the whole Cozy Tapes thing going on. ASAP Rocky's just known for being cool. Right. He's a cool dude. And... That kept moving on. He was on some tapes with them on some songs that did well. I think he was also on that song with Frank Ocean, if I recall correctly. But for me, when it really like became clear, like, oh, this is a thing, is when I was on that Smoke Purp and Little Pump tour. And I think that right around then was when, uh, what was that fucking song? I woke up to, I can like me. Oh, that, that woke up like, like this. Dude, woke that like song, this. like, I don't know if it came out during that trip or it just like hit during that trip, but it was like, everything like it just became everything and i don't know it's just it was hard to imagine things being the same after that and he was with uzi too yeah so he was kind of like uzi was doing everything uzi was really popping and it's kind of like these people did the press for him Mm -hmm. so he was able to stay rare yeah because there's other artists that have made good music and they try to do it but you need something associated with you Mm. that's gonna you know put out information on your behalf to keep people engaged but it's interesting when i give cardi points for being so rare and everything i mean some of the dudes that we really like congratulate at this point would be somebody like young boy he consistently puts out music over and over and over and when you look at the sort of like arms race for the people's hearts between like dirk young boy kodak Enelie Chapa, whoever, like all these dudes that you sort of put in this like similar category where like I feel like the fans could kind of go, a large percentage of the fans could go either way with like those being kind of like their favorite rappers, sort of similar stylistically and everything. Youngboy, like through being really consistent and dropping a ton of music, I think that that's been a huge asset in his whole ascent. Whereas with Cardi, I'm giving him props for barely putting music out and waiting fucking five years to drop a project and shit like that and but then you look at somebody like roddy rich roddy rich thought that he was kendrick he thought he was cardi he thought that he could take fucking two years off not put an album out whatever and then drop an album and that the people were just gonna go nuts for it and i think he kind of got a reality check of like oh fuck maybe you, you weren't in the position to take so much time off yeah and i think he also had a press issue too that happened afterwards mm. that was just something he couldn't control for because he also released an EP recently that I, don't, I didn't see anybody talk about. I didn't even know that. Yeah, it was like a three three song EP, and then I think he's maybe released a song since then. I'm not entirely sure, but something that happened after the album was he was performing at the same festival I think as Playboy Cardi, and that's when one of the fans had come on stage for Roddy Rich and Roddy Rich's team. You know, they tackled the guy, they got him out of the way, right? Which un- good, like yo, you're coming up on stage. You deserve whatever comes. Right. And then Roddy Rich, like, they're handling the guy. They're moving. And then Roddy Rich just, like, runs over, starts kicking the guy. Mm. And it doesn't look great, right? But at the same time, you could be like, yeah, what's he doing on stage? However, the contrast with a fan coming up to Playboy Cardi's set, Playboy Cardi's way hotter than Roddy Rich, and Playboy Cardi embracing the fan, dancing with them on stage, it makes what 
Roddy Rich did look worse in comparison. Mm. And I think people didn't like Roddy Rich enough, and his music had to be outstanding, or at least very different, mm. for people to keep talking about it. And he fell flat on the music, and the personality or the image or the branding wasn't going to carry it. So now he's in this odd position of, like, what should he do next? Right. And I don't know what he should do next. Yeah, because, I mean, when you look at Roddy Rich, it's like he... So much of his career was being sustained by one gigantic song, whereas on the other hand, with Cardi, I don't know if he's ever had a song that big, but he's, you know, and, and even when he puts that album out, like, there's no obvious single. There's, still to this day, I don't even know that there's a single. Like, how many videos does he even have for the album? He just, like, does Ew. a lot less than everybody else and somehow manages to thrive off that, yeah. But like, let's talk about this. It's like, what do you see as, like, the mission for your channel because sometimes you know and i like your channel but like sometimes it feels like it kind of like exists to uh i guess a friendly way of saying it would be it exists to point out uncomfortable truths about rappers to talk shit <laughs> maybe another way to say it would be to sort of uh revel in the bad luck of a lot of uh these artists yeah uh to a degree like for instance i mean we could talk about another uh topic that i'll get into just in a sec because i actually want to see this dude win right now but as of now, I want to make more research videos, but they take time. Like, for instance, like I made that Billie Eilish video, did like an, it was like over an hour long. It takes me a lot longer to make these research videos that are investigative pieces right. where I want to put something where people say, hey, this is content we're not seeing anywhere else. Because you could get 100,000 views from like Smoke Perp tripped on stage over a wire and fucking smacked his head and like... You, you could talk about that yeah. off the top of your head for 10 minutes and get 100,000 views. Or you could put a fucking grind into make one of these hour-long, fucking super deep, well-researched videos. And maybe it gets a million views, but maybe it takes you like 50 times as long to write. Yeah, you so know? That's, that's the dilemma. Or it may, it'll get like maybe like 200K, like yeah. not even a million. Yeah, yeah. And then you kind of weigh the you do cost benefit analysis, and it's also people want to hear me talk about certain like for for, for instance like Smoke Perp I I have no reason I haven't talked about him in months no mm -hmm. reason to really talk about him he was brought on stage by Cole Bennett recently which I think was super cool oh, I didn't know that was but that yeah. at the Lyrical Lemonade Festival yeah oh, it was wow. and people were like going crazy see that's an song. example of a good look that didn't apparently get too much burn since i didn't even know about it oh yeah i mean bad news travels faster hey yeah. I, I mentioned it i saw it right like shout out to him for that but i want to make more of those type of videos kind of like what jake tran did but more so towards hip-hop i like a lot of different uh like for example i had this one series that a lot of people are kind of like cult fans of it was like comparing like different stories in hip-hop to like a chapter of 48 laws of power oh yeah i've seen some of that yeah so there are certain videos that just take longer to make. And I'm also at the point where I was like, oh, I worked hard. I toiled for like four years. I want to live a little. Right. Because, the, okay, this is the thing is when you make these kind of videos, it's like a video about, you know, some sort of frivolous beef between two rappers. It's really just an opportunity for you to be able to talk about whatever the fuck you want. As long as you can connect it back to these characters. These are really just like characters in the soap opera and the interesting conversation is maybe not like the exact details of what happened. You know, there's definitely a place for that. And I think that like, you know, academics kind of, that's his market more than anything else is like some crazy shit happens in the streets and he's gonna tell you like the details first. He's gonna be there to tell you. But meanwhile, like, you know, if you have a greater understanding of relationships between people and how people tend to interact with each other like for instance the 48 laws of power would be like a great example i think that like there is a a way that you can just sort of talk about these characters in hip-hop and use it to like explain greater truths about humanity but a lot of youtubers they, they look at it like low-hanging fruit you know to make these kind of content but the reality is is that you can do such a killer job with it if you are willing to become so educated about relationships between people that it could be taken to another level and i, I think you do like a good job at kind of taking it to the next level like you, like you said with the 48 laws of power comparisons and stuff 
Yeah, that's something that I enjoy more of, honestly, because mm. the most important thing to me is really like relationships with people. Right. I enjoy talking to people. It's more fun. I don't really like care too much about like money after you know a certain threshold. You're like, okay, I don't have to worry about rent and stuff. Mm. And you know, I've been at that threshold for a little while. But what what is it that you think I could be doing better? No, I'm not even talking about you in particular. I'm just kind of saying YouTubers in general. Like I'll give you an example: is that when. The Beyonce, Jay-Z, Solange thing happened where she fucking kicked him in the elevator or whatever. That that just became the biggest conversation in rap for weeks afterwards. And this is before I was, like, talking about these kind of things on camera. Like, I might have been podcasting at the time, but I definitely wasn't, like, rushing to have that conversation or anything. And it stood out to me that the people who were doing a good job of making content out of that situation were basically, like using it as a jumping off point to have interesting conversations about cheating and about the fact that one of the most successful men in the world who's married to one of the most successful women in the world that they that he would still feel the need to cheat and the people that were doing a sort of bare bones job of it were sort of just having these boring conversations about like well I bet Beyonce feels like this or whatever and I don't know I just I, I just I'm not like offering you advice of like oh I think you should do it like this no, no, I'm I, saying I like you kind of you you do kind of do more of this I think than most people yeah but I also think it takes a lot of studying or like reading into stuff which I enjoy doing on right. my own time but a lot of other people they may not enjoy doing that because if your sole understanding of the situation is just this situation and you're not looking for like you know if you were able to say this reminds me of this situation that happened in rap 10 years ago and sort of go into detail about all these different rappers 10 years ago who ran into the similar situation and sort of be able to draw comparisons and impute some kind of wisdom from that and be able to say, I think this situation is likely to play out in this way because of these prior situations that I've seen or whatever, that that's an example of being able to use your greater cultural knowledge to be able to like embed more wisdom and learning in today's topic of the day, you know? Yeah. That's, I've done something like that twice, two big times. Right. Was when the first time was when I uh, predicted that Bad Bunny and Drake would have a song. It was like eight months ahead of time. Uh -huh. It was, I was really small at this time. Though. I think it was like a video about like Latin Trap, something like that was in the title. But I saw like Latin Trap was creeping in a little bit. I talked about how important demographics were in terms of they want a Latino audience mm -hmm. and the Latino is more likely to listen to someone that looks like them. So they would first pair it with like Cardi B or something, someone that speaks Spanish. And then if they were going to pair somebody with a rapper, Bad Bunny's the hottest thing, someone that's a little bit racially ambiguous that would fit the bill would be Drake. Mm -hmm. And he's like one of the biggest. So I was like, don't be surprised when Drake and Bad Bunny have a song in, in the future. Right. And then it ended up happening, Mia, that did really well. And then after that, it was TikTok, which I, I was so surprised that people were so vehemently against TikTok when it first came out. Like end of 2018, I saw TikTok because people were, they were advertising so much. That's how I saw them. They were in a Jay Critch music video. And I was like, okay, what is this app? So I download the app, I open it. And then people are scrolling. They're like, oh, look, at this time, it was just cringe compilations. Uh -huh. They're like, oh, this is some cringe. This is like kids. And I just saw that everything was music. There was music playing on everything. And I was like, this is a music application. Mm. And I was telling people, I was like, this is a very easy platform to go big on. It's very cheap to pay people at this point in time. And I said, this is going to be the biggest music app. Hmm. And then a couple months later, uh, Lil Nas X just takes off. Right. And then at this point in time, people are trying to get into TikTok. I had already kind of done like some side business stuff hmm. where like worked with a couple of artists and they did really well on TikTok. Some of them got signed. But now everyone's like, oh, I want to get on it at that time, which is maybe a year and a half ago, two years ago. But at that point, labels were already throwing a bunch of money. Managers got to a bunch of TikTokers. And the prices were just crazy. So mm. now you got you had the advantage, first mover's advantage, especially if you're an independent artist and you didn't take it. Now you can't compete with the prices that labels are willing to pay TikTokers. Right. Like a friend of mine, he was talking to Addison Ray, was it 2019, end of 2019, or maybe end of 2018? And she was like, Yeah, 500 for a post. She's like one of the biggest people at this time. Wow. And then three months later, she's charging like 50 grand for a post. Yeah. Because she got management and all mm. of that. So I think 
I enjoy looking at things more from like a broader perspective or more of a second layer. Right. Like, okay, this is the first layer. And then what's the second layer? What's behind this? Who wants this to do well? TikTok was bound to succeed considering right. the amount of advertising dollars that they spent. And it's one of those things where people hate it at first and then everyone eventually gets on it. Right. But, th- okay, part of the problem with making predictions is that I feel like you just don't get a lot of credit because people just fucking forget that you called it. And then if you are to remind them of the fact that you predicted the future, a lot of times they just don't give a shit. Like, for oh, instance, for sure. when I was in the BMX world, I was in like 2006, I started my site, right? So magazines aren't fully dead. Magazines, I don't think, fully died off in BMX until maybe 2013, 14, something like that. But I saw the writing on the wall because I'm looking at hip hop. I'm seeing the fact that the magazines are dying in all kinds of other industries. Like this used to be one of my big morbid pastimes on the internet was just watching different magazines go out of business every fucking week because it was happening so much. And so I'm basically competing for ad dollars with a bunch of different BMX media companies that are primarily based around their magazines you know they didn't really see themselves as media companies at the time they see themselves as magazines that are selling print advertising and i was just left and right saying this is bullshit they're charging so much the fans are getting all their information about bike riding from the internet they're lying to you about their circulation they're making you think that tens of thousands of people are seeing this when it's actually this number or whatever i was just very vocal about that i got you know Almost, I would say, like negative, uh, 100% uniform negativity in response because magazines were a beloved cultural tradition, you know? I think a lot of people, if they had been honest with themselves, would have said, like, yeah, you're right, but this is just like an uncomfortable truth that we don't want to fucking face. And then, like, once all the magazines went away, nobody, absolutely nobody said, hey, you predicted this when it wasn't obvious, when everyone told you you were wrong, you predicted this. Oh, no, I usually, got nothing in response in re- as a result. What usually you know? would, what probably would happen is they would probably just say, oh, yeah, of course. Like, we knew that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, that's how it was. Is now none of those people are, are talking about the fact that in 2006 they swore that magazines would never go away. Oh, yeah. They don't talk about that. I mean, it's kind of like when certain artists fall off, they, they're like, oh, yeah, we always knew they were going to fall off. Right. But BMX has a hard on for uh, the past, whereas, like, in rap, nobody misses magazines. Maybe some old heads miss it. That's true. But yeah. they don't really give a fuck because who the fuck cares? I think it's more like in tune with the youth culture and wherever it's going. Yeah, but even the old heads, I don't hear them like, oh, I miss when I used to go get the source every week, every month. Yeah, I think they more so look at it as a nostalgia thing than, oh, I wish I still had this right, right now. Because it actually sucked. Because you would like get a magazine, read it, learn a bunch of stuff, and then have to wait a month to get another one. Dude, that shit sucks. And there's like two magazines worth looking at. There's like maybe three or four if you like kind of are really deep into the shit. That shit sucked in retrospect. But now you have an over an oversaturation problem. What made it really because you were heavy into the BMX, the original, I think old videos still on No Jumper are BMX. Yeah. What made you want to pivot out of it and really just put both feet in? Because I feel like there was one foot in, one foot out for a little while in early No Jumper. Yeah. It was like 2006 to 2015. That was my entire life of just like wake up in the morning and find shit to post on my BMX website and work with the advertisers from BMX brands. And then around 2012, after I've been doing it for six years, I started to realize like, okay, my blog is not the end of this thing like it's actually about to be all about social media so i started to get real serious on youtube started uploading shit on there promoting it on youtube i started going on filming vlogs and paying different videographers to like create videos for the youtube channel of the bmx brand which you know i was making maybe like 10 grand a month off of selling advertising to different brands and stuff so and we're selling merchandise and stuff like that so i got this little business and it's it's doing something but i realized like oh like I'm making, you know, a thousand bucks a month selling t-shirts, but if I have 10 times as many Twitter followers, then I could maybe sell 10 times as many t-shirts. So I start going crazy. I got a bot that follows and unfollows people on Twitter. I'm fucking, you know, I was experimenting with trying to buy followers on Facebook. I never had any luck with the Facebook shit until we got a company to start running our Facebook for us. Um, but just in general, like once I, I had been doing that for a while since like 2012 and then like by like 2015 or so is like when I first started to get opportunities to interview rappers and it was like 
around that time, I was really getting burnt out on the BMX shit because it was just kind of like living the same fucking day over and over and over of just going to the skate park and making a video so I can make 250 bucks on AdSense. And, you know, we're going out and filming and it was just... You know, it's just I kind of like got to the point in my life where I was just like, this is fucking boring. And then around that time, I also started to have success with the no jumper thing. But then meanwhile, I also that's when the BMX side of things are actually started doing really well uh, business wise is I started to like I think I had my first ten thousand dollar month from AdSense on, on YouTube from the bike riding shit. Yeah. But at the same time, my heart just wasn't in it. So I just fucking fully like went all in on doing no jumper and just kind of fully went for that. Because it felt like yeah. there was a period of time, I don't know if it was maybe 2019-ish, where it felt like, from a viewer perspective, somebody that's been watching for since like maybe 2014, 15, that you kind of didn't know where to go f with No Jumper back then. You were kind of just doing all of the interviews. Mm -hmm. You didn't have a lot of the cast, I think. So where, where were you at that point? Yeah, like... I have like an urge to at some point do like a fucking full video about the history of No Jumper from my perspective and like really look at like everything that happened like that actually because like a lot of times people tend to be like oh you, you started out as a SoundCloud podcast and now you've interviewed porn stars and gang members and it's like okay like there's some truth to that but there's a lot of truth you're like leaving out and you're giving a sort of simplified version of how this all played out but definitely when I look at it's like 2016 was a great year 2017 was a great year I think 2018 was still pretty good, but that's like around the time that we like left the store. Like we really left the store in 2019, but we kind of like started to leave in like 2018. And it's like the whole vibe of it sort of started to like fall apart where like for a while the, the whole brand was just like being at that store all day, every day. My experience being in there every day, all day. And then like we moved to a different spot that wasn't at the store and we're like doing interviews, but it's just kind of like for the fans, it's not as exciting or interesting. And meanwhile, like hip hop's kind of shifting a bit where it's not like there's a new SoundCloud rapper every day, every day, you know? And so, yeah, 2019, I kind of look as like the worst time probably for the brand. And then 2020, it's like, oh, we have this total reset with covid where we're just like stuck in this office all day every day but luckily that's like when we brought ad in and then ad starts to bring more people around and then all of a sudden it starts to become like a crew vibe and we get sharp and we like we actually just like kind of like built the fuck out of the business during covid that's like when we got real serious about like creating a lot more content and all of a sudden we have all these live shows and stuff so i kind of feel like 2020 and really like the pandemic is the beginning of that was like when No Jumper kind of took on a new life and really became like the thing that it kind of is now where people even consider it like interesting enough to do meme pages about it and have a fucking thriving Reddit of people talking about it and shit like that. Because before that, it was like No Jumper's a brand, but it's basically the brand is just Adam interviewing rappers. So the whole thing lives and dies on like, did he get a good interview this week? Yeah. You know? And it felt like I, that that's really when I felt in 2020, 2019, when I was watching, because I don't really remember when AD came into the picture. Pretty much pandemic, like yeah, as soon as it started. Because I just, one day it was like he was just there. Yeah. And he had been there for a little while and people knew him. And it was basically like this new cast member. Yeah. And I was like, okay, this these things are moving in a different direction because I'm used to just straight no jumper for the past five years. So everything's right. changing. But I mean, we were doing the No Jumper show with me, Cam Girl, and House Phone, but it did, it was, I don't even think it was hitting like 100K, or like maybe it was getting like 100K, whereas like now it's like 250, 300K, so it was like, we were doing that, and we're like working on building out the cast, but, and especially when I look back on it, there were a lot of opportunities at the store where I could have taken people who were just hanging out at the store and been like, okay, I'm going to get you on camera, and we're going to start making content with you. And like it took me a little bit too long to notice that opportunity or to get comfortable because I kind of only envisioned No Jumper being like interviews. So I was kind of looking for somebody to have the exact same mentality as me and like be able to do the exact same thing as me. And it was once AD came around that I was like, oh, like this guy is cool on camera and the, the audience is kind of resonating with him and it doesn't matter that he doesn't know how to interview people and doesn't care and doesn't want to interview people, you know? I was kind of like, ah, like we could have different personalities that could just hang out and talk and they don't have to be like interviewing people necessarily. Yeah, because at because there was a point in time when Adpocalypse hit mm. and 
income had dropped for like pretty much everybody. Yep. Especially you were doing more content that was really towing the line of brand friendly, whatever the case may be. Yep. And then I don't know if it was 2018 or something when you started doing like the porn stuff. I feel like as a viewer, the income eclipsed it and it felt like you were trying to find someone to substitute you at no jumper. With who? AD? Not not AD. It just felt like you were kind of in the mind frame of, hey, if I could clone myself, right. I could just have this and then work on whatever else. It what may what be. it really was, though, is that I just like realized kind of early on that people thought of No Jumper as like a brand. And that when I started doing interviews that I didn't call it the Adam 22 interview show. And so there was that possibility for me to turn it into a brand and that like my friends were around were just being considered part of No Jumper. But I didn't really like they weren't really besides just like being in the vlogs and shit. We weren't making that much content with people at that time. But that was kind of like, even in 2018 or 2019, you could find interviews with me where I'm like, I want it to be a brand. I want to have all these different hosts. I want to, you know, like I started to see that vision kind of early on. It just like took me a couple of years to sort of really get comfortable putting people in position because even with ad or trell or duno whoever it's like i fucking i kind of have to just let go of control at a certain point you know and it's like some people like want to maintain like a really rigid amount of control and it's like i just have to accept that like you know there's a lot of stuff they talk about on the podcast that like i don't like or I disagree with, or I wish I was there to argue with, or whatever. But it's like if it's gonna be a platform, at a certain point, you just have to like kind of let go of control and like give people the freedom to try shit, you know, which can be kind of unnerving if you're a control freak like myself. Because now it feels like the new complex, like what complex was kind of supposed to be. You have this cast of different interests, like you have Duno, you have TRL, you have AD. A lot of people are interested in all of these people, and you're also bringing people outside of hip-hop right. so it's kind of like you what people are interested in as a whole and no jumper was already tapped into a lot of these different things right but now it's kind of like a podcast network and you've also got shows with like this uh, not a cooking show the food show that right. you've got or do one thing i'm super excited about is long beach griffey has like a weekly podcast that he's doing on here I'm like one episode's out He's not like rap specific, you know, he's like a huge YouTube channel doing like comedy skits and shit and his yeah. boys, they're more like gamers and anime type dudes, you know, it's like completely different types of fucking people like that. Realistically, if that becomes a hit, it's just going to bring a different audience that doesn't currently necessarily watch the channel, you know, and that to me is like kind of the thing that we have to sort of find a way to get to is like not just doing like 10 different shows talking about rap shit is like find different stuff. How did you evaluate him? Because he's specifically known for making short form skit content that he kills it in. Yeah. So but I had him think? on the podcast and it did pretty good. And I just felt like he can, then I talked to him and I realized like, Oh shit. Like he just wants to do a podcast. Like he, he saw us fucking with us as being like, dope to fuck with us but then also like oh shit i don't have to go through all the bullshit of like figuring out how to do a fucking podcast and i can just kind of get started with you guys i think that that kind of appealed to him you know and so you, you quickly knew like hey this guy could actually do this i i you know i figured he had a shot like same thing with sharp like i just figured i believe in this guy he's a natural i, I don't know if i believe in him a hundred percent but i believe in him enough to take a shot and it fucking worked you know and it's like same thing with AD. Like, I wasn't sure, you know? I just felt like it was a pretty good shot, you know? We've tried people out that the audience didn't seem to fuck with that much, you know? Yeah. How do you know the balance between, hey, people really don't mess with this, maybe I should cut it, versus people don't really don't mess with this right now, but we'll keep it going? Because the yeah. Flacco show, it seemed like it was getting a lot of, like, hate in the first one, two episodes. Right. And it seems to be doing really well now. <laughs> But I think it was, like, people were obsessed with him at first. Like, he became the focal point of, like, every conversation on No Jumper for a while. And then it became, like, now now he's, like, in more of a groove where he is controversial and stuff, but it's more consistent. But, like, with Flacco, it's, like, I just I see him as somebody who's working to get better, you know? And, like, he's he's definitely got better since he's been here for sure. And it's, like, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, you, you have to be willing to kind of, like, just not listen to the fans for a while at least. Yeah, But if you don't listen to him long term, you're probably making a mistake, you know? So, yeah, I feel like anybody, anybody I'm willing to give a shot at this point, because that's the thing is 
we're gonna like start doing these like more Twitch streams and stuff. Like we need more ways for us to like evaluate people on camera without necessarily like marrying ourselves to them and being like, oh, you're gonna have a show every single week. Here you go. Yeah. You know, like more ways to sort of gauge the audience's reaction to people. I think is important for us at this point. Because then there's the commitment too. So maybe they could be good on camera, but you don't know if they're gonna show up on time, show weekly, over a long period of time. Yeah. Was it e easier to kind of give that control? Because for you, it seemed like you've more so than content, you've kind of built businesses in different verticals in different eras of the internet too. Yeah. I just wish I had figured out the YouTube thing earlier because I think if I had figured out that YouTube was an important part of the puzzle when I started that blog in 2006, I think I could have skipped the line in a lot of ways. You know, it took me a while to figure that shit out. But yeah, I mean, it, it yeah. Definitely. Like, I just get bored so fucking easily that there's just, like, different things I want to dip my toe into. Like, the porn thing, I just saw it as, like, the business opportunity was too good, and I felt like I actually had something I could bring to the table, like, creatively. Like, maybe that hasn't necessarily been fully expressed yet, but I think that we could get there, you know, in terms of, like, I just think that there's room for, like, cool, exciting porn-based media companies that maybe hasn't been done yet. Which I would say the same thing about rap. I just kind of saw a hole in the game. Same thing with BMX. It's always been the exact same thing of just like find out about a niche, pay really, really close attention to it for a period of years and years. And then at a certain point, notice that there's a hole in the game or like a business that could exist that I have confidence in. And then just sort of drop in and give it a try. Even outside of just business, like for example, Pokemon Go, you went like kind of all in on that. Even when the fad, when the people that were there for the fad, I still left. play every day. Yeah, so it seems <laughs> like even on a personal level, you try to really, really, really get good at something. Which yeah. I feel the same way. I just anything that I get into, I can't do something as a hobby. Right. It's like I have to really, really try to get really good at this. Like you had the, you kind of popularized kendamas to people that probably would have never even thought about it. Yeah. Or used it in their life. It's like everything that I'm into, I just at some point end up starting some kind of business around it. And it's like, some like even with me and my girl and my kid, I notice us just getting more and more into making like family TikToks and shit. And I'm like, there was only a matter of time until I managed to like start making content out of the family thing. But Do I'm not, not mad at it. Fear of the family being on the internet because like a lot of weird shit goes on. Like, a lot of people leave crazy comments yeah. and stuff like that. It's just part of it, you know? You just got to, like, accept that at a certain point. But it's like, ah, I can't control what people say. And it's like, yes, it is kind of scary at times. And you, like, really want to be careful to, like, you know, sort of allow your kid to... You don't want to put them in a weird situation in terms of, like, making them famous against their will, you know? Yeah. So that's definitely a concern. I think, like, at a certain point, Casey Neistat stopped showing his kids' faces in the videos, and I think about that all the time. And it's like, really, realistically, like, probably a very small amount of weird shit would have to happen to us before we would make that decision, you yeah, know? True. Like, it feels like it's all sweet right now, but, you know. Because the way I just look at it for me is, or just like people, when people, your mom or somebody would show, like, pictures of you as a kid, you're like, come on, mom, you know, that's a little bit embarrassing. <laughs> yeah. As opposed to, like, it's on the internet now but we try not to show anything embarrassing we try to like That's like good. you know if she fucking shit herself or puked everywhere or something like i think there was one thing like that where she like puked all over herself and it looked super funny and like we thought for a second of posting the photo and then we were like oh wait no like we definitely want to only present her with some dignity online like i think that's where the line got crossed with you remember uh what was it daddy of five this was like one of the biggest uh, Phil DeFranco videos is basically like him exposing this guy who is kind of like making family videos. And at a certain point, he starts to realize that like if he clickbaits with like one of the kids hitting the other kid, that it would get more views. And so then they all of a sudden started like orchestrating like weird fake scenarios and like maybe some of it's real where you got like the kids like punching each other and shit. And like YouTube took the whole fucking channel down and everything at a certain point. But you see these sort of like perverse incentives that cause people to start doing this weird ass shit with their family and stuff. Yeah, that's it's so difficult. I I just wonder, for example, just the daily vlog thing, even not on a not on a family level. Right. When I look back at it now, 
I wonder how the hell Casey Neistat was able to do that. He's, he's basically doing it again with the, the New York, he moved back to New York, and I don't think he's doing daily, but he's making a shitload of videos, and he's just out and about in the city getting asked for 8,000 selfies every day, and he's just Nuts. he's just trusting the goodwill of humanity that nothing weird's going to ever happen to him living in this fucking jungle. Yeah, because then you kind of have to structure, like right now you have a work-life yeah. separation maybe some people don't have a balance or whatever the case may be but there's a separation mm. whereas when you're vlogging your life you're kind of like okay what is my life going to look like today yeah. on the camera and then you know for me it would be like maybe i'm in the office or, or at the store doing eight hours of content and maybe i'm tired and maybe i just really want to go home and get some fucking sleep or whatever but it's like no i could go over to little pump's mansion and like sort of hang out and be a fly on the wall just kick it smoke weed with the guys for a couple hours and then that would be the deciding factor between this vlog getting 200,000 views and 2 million views or 5 million views or whatever you know and it's like it just sort of became weird where it's like all of a sudden the incentives driving everything you do in your day-to-day -day life are basically based on what's going to get you the most YouTube views because that's going to get you the money and that's going to allow you to have some degree of freedom or whatever. And yeah, it's, it's been weird because you know, the, the, the platform very much just like dictates like who you are as a person. And I think about that every day when I look at girls on Instagram who are not porn stars, they don't have OnlyFans, and they're taking the thoughtiest fucking photos. Well, plenty of them do have OnlyFans, but they're, they're taking thoughty ass photos and basically looking like porn stars, doing everything besides making actual porn. And why? Because they want to get fucking likes on Instagram and that this has changed the world so much because when I was young when i was like 18 or 25 or even like you know earlier in my life it's like this was not normal culturally yeah. but the app tells you that this is the way to do it and so they're doing it and for me as somebody who wants to see girls naked on the internet i'm totally fine with it but it is fucking weird and it's important that we are aware of the fact that the platforms are telling us what to do basically twitter twitter is the same way the meanest thing that you could say on twitter will be the most popular tweet that you ever do in your life yeah you know, if the queen dies and you go on Twitter, we saw this, that one professor goes on there and basically says, good, this bitch is stupid. You know, she sucked. She was a white supremacist, whatever. Twitter removes it, but I had like, you know, a million likes before they removed it. It's like that Twitter has created a landscape in which the meanest thing that you could possibly say is going to make you famous. Yeah, that's that's specifically Twitter for sure. Yeah. More than I think it amplifies it more than any other thing. Yeah, because on Instagram, if I go on my story and I say, "Hey, fuck the queen," what are what are people going to do? They're going to screenshot it and put it on Twitter. Yeah, maybe you know it's going to make its way to some Instagram pages and shit like that, but it's not going to be. Instagram is not geared for that. No, it's in Twitter. the same way. Yeah, but when it comes to people kind of getting consumed and moved by the content or the viewership, I feel like that's kind of what happened to Sneeko, leading to him like getting banned off of YouTube now. Well, refresh, well, let me know, because I don't know why the fuck he got banned. I don't know exactly why he got banned. It just happened today. Right. But he had two strikes right. on one channel. And then oh. like I think he took down a bunch of videos. Yeah. And then today, he just posts on Instagram, his main channel and his second channel just terminated. Well, Brandon Buckingham is claiming the body. Yeah, but I think that's just a, a coincidence. <laughs> he put out a big video about him. I and then saw it. he showed that Sneeko, maybe, I don't know, maybe it's because they deleted the channel that it says this, but he showed like a social blade screenshot that made it look like he deleted like 7 million views worth of videos, which was probably a fuckload of his more popular videos. So maybe he was trying to do that in the lead up to getting deleted. I don't know. But I mean, I do think like, bro, in this this modern landscape it's like they're setting up rumble or whoever becomes like the alternate video provider like that opportunity is wide open for somebody right now and i think when you have sneeko and andrew tate and donald trump and alex jones and all these fucking people lewis farrakhan like there's a lot of fucking people who are banned from social media it's like it's only a matter of time until one of these platforms really has like a th like i heard rumble is actually pretty popular to a degree I, I know andrew tate gets a lot of views on there but the thing is with sneeko I'm not sure that he has the fan base right. that would follow him there. I think he had it before this blow up. But I could see it becoming normal in a year or two for there to be enough canceled creators that people want to hear from that all of a sudden, even for somebody like me, maybe it makes sense to log into Rumble once or twice a day to look at the content from all these guys. And for me, it's like I'm not a hardcore 
Andrew Tate or Sneeko fan, right? Like I'm not watching their fucking content on a, on a consistent basis. But if I was that guy, you know, let's say you academics, Joe Budden and fucking, I don't know, uh, wh whoever else, Sam Harris, else. All, th say they all, yeah, they all get deleted off YouTube and they all have to go to Rumble. Well, all of a sudden I'm looking like a Rumble viewer, right? I mean, I, I feel like it's starting, like for a lot of conservative people and right-leaning people, it's it's already there pretty much. The That's why I think it's so important that Rumble is potentially, I don't know if it's a thing yet, getting Steve will do it because you yeah. need to diversify the content. Right. You don't want to be known as, oh yeah, yeah. this is the right-leaning platform. And that may not be the intention of the platform, right. but everyone that ended up getting banned just so happened to be in this bucket yeah. and they moved here. Because so immediately then your image starts to be, oh, that's the platform where white supremacists feel like they can get away with shit that they wouldn't get away with on other platforms like the the day you start your platform that is like we're going to be a free speech platform i mean that's immediately that's what's going to turn into is yeah. like okay we're going to be talking about how the, the holocaust did not happen let's yeah, go that's much it. yeah and, or like you get a bunch of anti-semitism that comes in there a bunch of all of these different groups that even the people that some people that got banned, they're like, yo, we're not we're not these guys. So I think there needs to be diversity. And that's why I think YouTube really messed up by banning mm -hmm. Steve will do it, because that was a ridiculous ban. Yeah. Like, nobody was like, yeah, great. That guy got banned. Right. It's just what for some gambling thing that was an accident yeah. that wasn't even intentional. Yeah, I mean, a lot of these dudes like fucking speed and destiny and all these fucking people are banned off twitch and so they go to youtube and then realistically like how long are they gonna last on youtube before they're off that and you know maybe facebook doesn't work out and uh you're like quickly creating a landscape in which you know if if destiny has to go to rumble i guess i'm going to rumble sometimes you know yeah. do you think there's more of a demand for the type of content that isn't very very I would say like lukewarm, for instance, Destiny, Speed, uh, let's say just Andrew Tate, yeah. go. like there's been a huge demand and people are trying to portray it as, oh, these people are influencing people to like them. But I think people have just been searching for something like that. Right. And there's like this new younger generation that's like, yo, we're kind of like these edgy kids that like to crack jokes and talk shit on video right. games. This Speed <laughs> guy's just like us. We can watch him, and he's not censoring himself. Right. Yeah, I mean, and if you look at even just within hip-hop, it's like, who are the popular woke voice boxes in hip-hop? Charlemagne? Yeah, like, he's the closest thing that you're probably going to get to. And Charlemagne even, like, what what was the clickbait on the Logan Paul clip? He said that, like, every woke person needs to go take a nap or some shit. Like, I don't think Charlemagne, like, realizes that he's sort of uh, gone all in on the woke shit sometimes. And sometimes I feel like he has some regrets about maybe, you know, putting himself in that box, I think. Yeah. But when you look at all the, the important voice boxes in rap, I mean, you got Joe Budden's not exactly a uh, PC act. Me, Vlad, like these are not people who are like having these sort of like tame conversations where, where everything is geared back to the like default social justice warrior viewpoint. It's just not something that is going to work in hip hop. I can't think of anybody who is even close to like being like truly woke that it has a popular platform in rap music. Well, I think that's kind of a bind that the bigger platforms are in where culturally hip hop is not woke or soft or anything mm. like that. So if they kind of impose against that, they'll get a bunch of accusations of whether it be racism or trying to hold the culture back right. that they're like hey we have to give more leeway to this genre of content and music as a whole yeah that actually is totally true if academics was white <laughs> there's no way he would have a spotify deal ah uh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> and don't take it that wrong way i'll clarify my remark just to make it clear what i mean but a lot of the things that i think that he's kind of said and done, whether it's the Chrissy Teigen bitch thing and all this other stuff. I feel like, dude, if academics was white, he would just be viewed as like a damn near like a Nick Fuentes type, you know, like he, even oh, yeah. him platforming Candace Owens, if he was white, oh my God, like in hip hop, that would be, dude, that would be a big fucking deal. They sort of like let him get away with a lot of toxic type stuff, I think. Yeah. If you think about that, that is kind of But Joe Rogan had a Spotify deal, and he's kind of, well, stuff has resurfaced, I guess. Joe, yeah. Joe Rogan didn't have that brand. 
So I could see where you're coming from. But it is crazy because I feel like Joe Rogan did not have that brand really until he started to be with Spotify. It's like once he fully saddled himself with a big corporation, then it became like, ah, we can put pressure on Spotify to drop him. Whereas a lot of creators, it they don't really have that because it's like Andrew Tate has never had a fucking sponsor in his life that I know of. You know, I'm sure he probably had some Manscaped deal or some shit over the years, but you know, he's not. He's not relying on corporations, but that's why they go for his social media accounts because that's the best way to silence him. And it's a scary, scary sign of the times. Because that's one thing that I wonder is, for, for instance, I could see some reasons for Sneeko being banned. Right. Some. Like, I'm not saying he deserves to be banned. I don't want anybody to be banned, really. Right. Unless they're, like, doing something crazy. And I want the rules that they've established to be implemented fairly. And I also think that damn near everybody on the platform needs to have a path towards rehabilitation, right? Yeah. You know? Like, let's say 10 years from now, Alex Jones is a fundamentally different person. And he's, like, really... Uh, I, I personally consider him to be a pretty heinous person that... If I ran YouTube, I probably wouldn't want him on my platform either. But do you not think he's hilarious? I, I think he's funny. I'll okay. give him that. Sure, but I'm just saying, like you know, people should be given the space to change. And I hate the idea that like somebody gets kicked off social media and there's no possible way that they get to change. It's like it's sort of analogous to the the court system where it's like to be given a life sentence is the biggest fucking deal in the world. Why why is it so out of bounds? Like why couldn't Destiny have been given you know a six month sentence? on Twitter where yeah. he got kicked off the platform for whatever they thought that he did. Why does it have to be immediately expulsion? Yeah. And then there's certain people that don't get banned. For instance, James Charles has done worse stuff than <laughs> Andrew Tate or Sneeko has ever done. And he's mm. not even demonetized, let alone being banned. And this is multiple times yeah. that, you know, he's that, gotten into trouble. But that kind of raises the question of like, what's worth banning somebody for too? Because, James Charles doesn't have any criminal issues. Well, neither does Sneeko right. or Andrew Tate. And what would the, you know, because if somebody was, you know, convicted in court for being a serial rapist, I mean, that's not a reason to take their YouTube channel away, right? Wouldn't you want, I would want a YouTuber to feel free to chronicle, to chronicle the life of him as somebody who is somebody who just did eight years in prison for rape. Yeah. You know, like... And that, that's the kind of weird thing about, or, or like why when somebody kills a bunch of people, are they not allowed to have a YouTube channel? Because they do that. Like if you're a school shooter, they pull your fucking YouTube channel down immediately. Isn't that they important? They did the same thing with the guy that there was like some shooting in Brooklyn uh, several months ago, this really old guy. Really? Yeah. It was, he didn't kill anybody, but I think he shot like seven people. And I was watching his YouTube channel like later that night. Really? So I was watching his videos. I'm watching it. And then I'm like, all right, I'll check the rest of this out tomorrow. I wake up, it's gone. Right. I had that experience where I was watching, um, oh no, I had loaded up Nick Cannon interviewing, was it Louis Farrakhan that got him fucking canceled? No, 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 no. it was, uh, oh, I know exactly what you're talking about. It was, uh, oh, it was uh, Professor Griff yes, from, yes. from Public Enemy. Yes. And I watched like the first 20 minutes and then I went and like did some chores around the house and then I went back to watch the rest of it and it was gone. Yeah, that that was gone and then they had Nick Cannon going on an apology tour and yeah. And that's that's the one thing I don't feel like people should double down if they know they're not ready to lose, like everything corporate. Like, cause Nick Cannon doubled down. Mm. Did maybe double down and then kind of pivoted and right. you know did a bunch of different things. But I think somebody like Nick Cannon didn't realize how bad being canceled was going to actually be. And when I say canceled, I mean by the Jewish community specifically, because it seems like it's a lot worse to offend them than almost any other group. And Viacom. Pretty much had his show because I think he thought like, oh, I own my show. Nothing can. That's right. exactly what he said explicitly. But he's he's really like fallen back and just sort of like ceased to say anything controversial. I think he realized that he needed to let some time pass, crank out seven more children, and then maybe people would just move on and forget. Because like, okay, when I met Nick Cannon, the first thing I wanted to ask him, and I did not ask him this first because I didn't want to make it seem like I had too much invested in this, but I was like, what happened? to the interview that you did with Richard Spencer, renowned or extremely well-known white supremacist, probably is the most... Storm guy? Uh, Stormfront, or is that the other... No, nah, Stormfront was like a, a white power website or something, but R Richard Spencer was that guy that you used to always see at like every protest wearing a suit in like 2016 type era, and uh, he's still not banned off Twitter, interestingly, but... 
Nick Cannon did a podcast with him, and I saw that, and I thought, holy shit, because it feels like in the mainstream media world, he's very much like, they did some articles about him and stuff, but he's not like going on people's podcasts. Like I think people have genu- generally agreed that it's like platforming voices that are going to be saying stuff that they consider as offensive as whatever he says is not a good idea. But then Nick Nick Cannon did it, and I asked him about it, and he told me that he didn't just fly him out to do it. He fucking f- he went to Montana to interview Richard Spencer. And that it's still not out. And I'm not sure why, though. I'm not sure. Because I think he stopped releasing episodes of his podcast. I believe so. In general. It was like it was the Cannons class one, right? He, yeah. He told me it was still coming out. Because I would just love to hear them have a conversation. Because i seen a little clip of it. And it seemed like they were kind of agreeing on whatever they were talking about. They, they were. It didn't feel like a bad, tense vibe. Which I thought was really fucking interesting. Cause, and that made me want to know what them talking was going to be like for sure. So there's a Richard Spencer, Nick Cannon interview in the vault somewhere. It's out there. We could probably go over and watch it at Nick Cannon's crib. Damn. I don't know if that's the best use of our time, but yeah. <laughs> I don't know what he would think our motives were. <laughs> we're just trying to learn as much about white power as we can, Nick. So. I don't know. Um, yeah, do you ever, do you feel like guilty ever at just sort of like chronicling the, the fall of so many of these rappers and and do you ever feel like you're sort of like unevenly making these videos because let's be real there's probably a lot of rappers who are also dramatically falling off and buying fake numbers and having this sort of depressing career arc that you maybe aren't drawing attention to yeah i don't feel guilt necessarily i do feel like i don't want to do certain types of content in the future for example like the that kid Leroy video that i made uh, a couple mm. years ago that went crazy and it was i feel like it was a good investigative video but i don't think i would make something like that again even as a, a pal of his i would agree though that was that was interesting shit that was stuff that somebody was gonna have to bring to the surface sooner or later and even for me like when i interviewed him i mean it was just like a thousand percent different at that time when i was in australia versus where he's at now and like you know, he used to have like, like when I interviewed him, it was off of this like lyrical ass rap that he was putting on YouTube. Yeah. It's been stricken from the internet. And there was also certain stuff that I had information on that I didn't put in the video at all mm. because a lot of it is, it's not necessarily hearsay. Like there's proof of it, but I wouldn't want to put that out. Right. So types of stuff like that, I'd probably I'd try to avoid a little bit more. One thing I try to do is give credit for like, let's say I talk about, for like, for example, Lil Pump. Lil Pump. I was talking about him consistently when he came out. I was like, this is this is terrible. So I didn't really pivot, but now I think Lil Pump has been dropping great songs. So I make you it like a point. You like his current music? Yeah, yeah. Wow. I actually enjoy okay. some of it. So I make it a point to post his stuff and talk about it favorably when I actually enjoy it. So they understand that I'm not just trying to hate. Right. I'm, I'm surprised you said just because, like, I listened to the new Lil Pump song and video. I think it's called Mosh Pit. And there was just like... You know, it, it kind of like I guess the production has evolved. You know, production in general has evolved. There's like one line on the song though where he says like, "My grandma is off prescription pills," and I'm yes. just like, "Bro, you you already did that line." Yeah. Like that. Like I want to get behind him. Like I want to see him grow and like do something interesting musically. And like I just you know I just don't really see it. I see him just sort of retreading the same ground as before. But you have to give him credit because back then he just used to repeat the same thing. The entire song now there's like actual structure to some of the writing yeah. he's using the same line but it's like six nine six nines use like the ray charles to the bullshit line like 50 times it's <laughs> it's so mind-numbing how much he's reused certain lines that right. are so simple i'm like dude you just get a writer or something yeah and i think lil pump he has he's experimenting with different sounds the producer that he's working with right now is moving him in a different direction Lil Pump can't just come out with, like, woke music or, like, trying to yeah. mature. So no, I definitely not this. that. Yeah. But I just feel like when you're, like, literally saying the same bar that was in, like, your biggest hit, and the only difference is that you said great grandma, I mean, that's just, like, the, I think the people want growth. And I think 6 ix a huge example of that. Like, I mean, you've seen the way that people just lost interest in his shit. It's just it's the same shit that he was putting out before he went in. Worse. It's worse. It's worse. It's less compelling. Worse. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, it's just there's no growth, and I think the audience just is gonna need to see growth. And six nine thinking that he was gonna get a career jump start from saying "fuck King Vaughn" is like, bro, 
I don't think you he's going to get a career jump start. Yeah. I, I, I think he's just, I don't know. I think he's sincerely full of hate, and he he sees himself as a fucking gangster. So it's like he wants to do the gangster thing. So he wants some his enemy to die, and then he talks shit about him. He did it with yeah. PMB. He did it with fucking Vaughn. He did it with everybody. And it's just like, bro, the fans are not going to like you off of that. But that's one thing that Tory showed is that Tory Lanez, for example, he didn't have the same situation as 6 9 in terms of like Tory didn't snitch on anybody. But he got canceled also, in much the same way. We yeah. also have to ba- throw the balance and drop the question of like, what's worse within hip hop? Let's say allegedly shooting a woman or snitching. I, I don't I don't really know. Right. But let's just say I would say they're probably like in the same ballpark. I think just people genuinely don't think that he shot her. Yeah. The huge amount of people like there's just so many artists that fuck with Tory Lanez and are still rocking with him that it's like it seems like he didn't shoot someone, right? Yeah, especially now. (laughs) You know? Yeah. But he's also a little brawn bobbing his head to his shit, right? Yeah. I mean, that's just like, you know, if you had a hundred different rappers who shot a hundred different women. I don't think LeBron's bobbing his head to any of them. But because apparently not, he believes Tory Lanez. Not conspiracy theory wise, but I feel like for LeBron, someone with as big of a brand as LeBron, this right. is like almost the rock level. Right. I feel like he had to get information that exactly. oh, we know he didn't do that. Because and, if there's yeah. even a percentage chance that he did it and LeBron was bumping that song, that's so much irreversible damage. <laughs> that to clip his is brand. gonna age so poorly, yeah. So I feel like somebody <sighs> tapped LeBron on the shoulder, maybe yeah. Tory's lawyer or something, and told them like, "Yo, here's the evidence. Here's everything we're about to present." And right. LeBron's like, oh, "Okay, you definitely didn't." But do this. but a lot of a lot of people have fucked with Tory in recent oh, yeah. memory, you know. And it's like, yeah, Drake left him on red apparently, but there's a lot of people who didn't, you know. I mean, he was like hooping at Drake's house like in the past. Year. Right, but he had an interview quote where he said that he sent Drake a song or some shit, and that Drake left him on red and didn't do the feature. Oh, that's just him. At, oh, no. He was talking about The weekend and Drake. People were asking him how come he didn't do a song with either of them. He's right. like, oh, I've sent them stuff. They just haven't sent it back. It's, right. It is what right, it is. Right, because, I mean, I do think that Drake does not want the negative PR that he would get from doing a collaboration with Tory Lanez. He's very careful about who he fucks with. There's a lot of people that I think he fucks with. Like, bro, you remember, like, Ian Connor posting like screenshots of his like conversations with Drake about Cardi and stuff at, at, at one point. Yeah. But this is like, but you did you ever really see Drake like showing Ian Connor love like on his socials? No, you saw Kanye West doing it though. True, you saw Kanye. Kanye's embraced a lot of fucking canceled people though. He's gone way beyond that. He's fucking with Marilyn Manson and everybody. <laughs> but then meanwhile, you know, I think Drake is very careful about who he's gonna fuck with in terms of canceled people for sure. Yeah, but then you've got people like in his inner circle that are un- unsavory to say the least. But they're not public figures, yeah. so perhaps that's yeah. I, I think Drake would probably be like at the front of the line to work with Tory Lanez if he is proven not guilty. You know, I, I, but there's also there's there's a lot of levels to not guilty. Like if Tory Lanez gets proven not guilty, and then it's like OJ vibes, where like everybody still thinks he did it. Mm-hmm which I don't think that's going to be the case because there's already so many fucking people who don't think that he did it. You're going to see a different... Because it's like, no matter what, they're going to have to go into overdrive to try to rehabilitate Meg's career and figure out how to make her not look like the scourge of the fucking earth as a result of her seemingly having lied to the world, right? Do you think that that'll even happen for at Megan? I feel like the people that are going to hate Megan are the people that aren't even fans of Megan. I think... Megan, if Tory Lanez is found not guilty, is going to be like Amber Heard times a thousand. Because nobody gave a fuck about Amber Heard before this, before the Johnny Depp shit, you know? That's true. I feel like if it's going to be bad, she's going to have to go into hiding. I'm not encouraging it. I'm just saying you are going to see a toxic, mobilized fan base, the likes of which you've never seen if Tory walks out of that courtroom a free man. Yeah, and his fans cannot wait and i think the industry also will separate themselves from her because just on a music level tory lanes is way more talented he's gonna Mm. be up if the case comes out that he's innocent and she right now musically is you know like a little bit on quicksand but i don't man i don't know i don't know if i see the the industry separating themselves from her because no matter what i think they're going to be able to find a narrative by which she's still the victim I mean, collaborators in terms of other rappers, I think they may distance themselves. Yeah, true. But I just, I think that the same type of support that she has right now from the industry 
it's hard for me to imagine that going away. Oh, that's what I was saying earlier. Yeah, yeah that's why I said, do you really think it's going to be that? Because I think corporate-wise, they're going to keep – they've invested right. a lot into her already. But, but at what point do you become like Amy Schumer? Where you just are so cringy and just deplorable and the people hate you enough that you just kind of stop getting those opportunities, even though you do tick a lot of the marginalized boxes. You're fucking obese and you're you're a woman and whatever. They want to support you. They think that's so great. I don't know if they could put Meg in that category, though. I don't think so. But it's I also the amount of heat that people were getting when they even threw out a shred of the possibility that this may not have been what it was written in the beginning right. was insane. I remember the amount of comments I was getting was crazy. Right. And I was just entertaining the possibility of, hey, maybe this is not what we're purported to believe. Like, oh, this is definitely he shot her and yeah. he told her dance, bitch. Like that, that when I heard that, I was like, dude, come on. But the climate of that conversation has changed a lot where you, yes. like I was listening to this New York Times podcast about, uh, the Meg thing or about Meg's like musical output. And they put this out like a few weeks ago or whatever. And the level of admiration and respect and just adoration that these female music critics had on this podcast for Meg was something that I, I know that's out there, but I could not have expected that it would have been to the extent that it really was where they're talking about on my timeline, everybody is just so excited for every Megan the Stallion release, like yada yada. And I'm just thinking, like, what the fuck planet? Like, I must really be in a bubble on my Twitter because I see zero appetite for her fucking music, you know? Like it comes out and I, I don't hear anything about it. And it's like these these women live in a bubble where that's all that they see is that there's just a huge amount of support. I realized that too when Joe Budden told me uh, Kevin Kevin Samuels was so controversial, like the majority of people hated on him or like women hated on him. I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? I don't know anybody who is anti Kevin Samuels, but that's yeah. that's my bubble. You know, is that I don't fucking interact with woke ass people that are going to get their feelings hurt by somebody saying the types of shit that Kevin Samuels was saying. Yeah, I didn't see I didn't see the hate for Kevin Samuels until after he passed away. Yeah, yeah. Then for it sure. Was, it was in abundance. And think ever. about how I see it. I see it because people within my sphere are quote tweeting enraged feminists and basically dunking on them for their opinions. You know, it's like Dude. I'm not seeing it discussed sincerely. I'm seeing it because people like only once it gets to the point where people are ripping on them for their opinions, you know? Mm. Yeah. But I think Tori showed like he's back on playlists now. So consistently he was able to win favor, which I think Six Nine could have done. If Even the biggest playlist? I think he was on Rap Life. He's not on Rap like, Caviar? I don't think so yet. Oh, I'm not entirely sure. But I know he's been put on on the thing New Music Friday, which is one of the biggest Spotify playlists. Let me tell you, he never gave up fighting. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Like the spirit with which he has really uh taken on this quest to make everybody like him again you gotta respect it although punching the dude in the face the other day seemed like it was probably a bad look which dude august alcina oh yeah yeah, yeah. that wasn't they, uh, that was not a seemed like a look. bad idea but i feel like people already weren't too in favor of august alcina it's not like somebody that's you know heavily liked by the people that tori enjoys yeah so, I and i feel like there was very little like condemnation and i might be wrong because again bubbles online maybe i just didn't see the tweets but i didn't really see that many people like shitting on tori for doing that because in the rap world nobody cares in the more woke general community i could see them caring because like oh this sort of proves their narrative that tori lanes is an abusive piece of shit yeah but, I, uh, I said something about it. I was like, this is a very, very dumb thing for Tory Lanez to do in the position that he's in. Right. But I think it wasn't a woke enough topic to reach outside of hip hop to that audience. Like, right. oh, it's some dude hitting another dude. Like, if it was like he hit a girl, then it's going to pierce out to that right. circle. It's crazy, though, to just think about the different standards that different entertainers are held to because that smack was like objectively probably more violent than what Will Smith did to Chris Rock. Now, granted, it was backstage as opposed to on the stage, which feels important, even though it probably shouldn't. Like, you know, just somehow the fact that everybody saw it right in front of their eyes on TV, it feels like that's probably like a bigger factor in him being canceled. Like, I think if Will Smith smacked Chris Rock backstage, he wouldn't have been nearly as canceled. Yeah. Like, it was if it was written, like, oh, 
here is the article will smith smacked what's his name backstage yeah it wouldn't have hit as much it's yeah. kind of like for instance like the chris brown rihanna thing from back then if there wasn't a photo of it mm -hmm. i don't think it would have been as no way. bad yeah. and big as it was but when you've because you're like oh he beat her you're like ah, oh, how bad like we don't know you're yeah. just like oh he beat her that's bad because i remember 20 18 the, i think fabulous uh knocked his girl's teeth out and yeah. i never saw a photo so i feel like fabulous could kind of just like drop an album and the people wouldn't be talking about it same thing uh with slim jimmy i don't know if it was true but tmz was reporting it they were like oh his baby mama or something like he knocked out her front row right he got locked up or some shit right we didn't see any photos of it any images of it yeah any video of it and it just kind of went by the wayside or for instance like young boy kind of got into some stuff and famous decks when they were in a hotel camera and they were just like yep. throwing around as soon as you have a visual aid because what young boy did to her in that video was not that bad he like pushed her down right yeah i think so it's like that what dex did was wild though oh yeah, yeah. what dex did was insane he was throwing blows yeah damn he's uh i don't even know where he's at right now i don't know if he's in jail i think he's still in rehab that's how, i've been dming him a little bit although i guess he probably couldn't dm me i think he's like on house arrest or i don't know he's in some sort of limbo okay you got high hopes for famous dex you're gonna chronicle his downfall no i don't have anything more to talk about famous dex I, right. uh, honestly i i think he had a wave i'm not entirely sure what he could do other than be consistent yeah. maybe but it's a lot of people's time has passed but i think if famous dex got sober and started to make music that was fundamentally a lot more interesting than pretty much everything he's put out in the last few years i think the people would be willing to accept him because this shit is all about narrative building yes and as soon as you have a good famous dex narrative of like he's doing good he's making more creative music here's this one single that you guys all fuck with i feel like he could be accepted with open arms but it's not going to happen while he's still getting fucked up. But do you think Famous Dex could make even the level of music that he once made not s made sober? Uh, that's that's tricky because even when, at his highest heights musically, it was such energy music that it's like a sober person almost like couldn't make that kind of music. You know, there's a, a lot of artists over the years, whether it was like Gucci Mane when he was kind of in his prime or even, you know, e even Lil Pump or even fucking, you know, a lot of the Fredo Santana shit or whatever. It's like, it's like you couldn't unwind the fact that this is intrinsically based on drugs and the drugs are part of it. It's like, this isn't a Gucci rap now. It just sounds very logical <laughs> like makes sense yeah and like gucci when he was in his prime you felt like you were listening to a fucking serial killer that could just go crazy at any given moment because he seems so like disattached from reality very volatile detached at that point yeah. in time as well yeah. well i mean kevin gates i don't know if he does any drugs but his music is very <laughs> right crazy yeah young boy yeah sounds like he's just having these wild mood swings on the track he's just like such an emotional person yeah but he also balances out releasing a lot with not really doing interviews not true carefully like leaking stuff that's information about him. if young boy had been doing like you know five interviews a year for the last five years i think that that would have a fundamentally like bad impact on his career and i yeah. say that as somebody who would love to interview him and i would i it would benefit me more than almost anything if he were to do an interview but I think a lot of artists don't realize that you're sort of like giving up the your gift by putting your personality out there and spelling it out so easily. Yeah, because then what what would really separate him from a lot of I think he would just be pulled down into this pool of other rappers that make similar music to him. Yeah. And then his popularity would just be at their level. Right. Cuz think about like if Cardi did I don't know, Breakfast Club or No Jumper or Vlad or whatever. It's like it would be seismic if he did that right now. Yeah. But if he did it again, if he did somebody else's show six months later, it would be significantly di diminished, you know? It's like he's built up this unbelievable appetite for him. Why the fuck would you give that away in a format that's not monetized, you know? Yeah. Dudes like Jay-Z stored up their whole career. They stored up their drama and the, the their deepest thoughts, et cetera, and then they like unleash it on one big album that you have to buy. 
Yeah, and that wise. sprint buys like five hundred thousand copies. Of. True, but I mean, I'm just saying, if you if you give it all up on like ten different interview platforms early on, don't be surprised when people aren't all that interested in what you got to offer. But no, rappers don't necessarily have to just talk about themselves. Some are can talk about topics and be entertaining in that way, and mm. then their personality shines and people like them more. But yeah. they still don't really know too much about them. But but who, when you think about a Boosie or when you think about a I don't know, all these fucking dudes who are basically like making careers talking about shit on camera. I don't think any of them balance that with being a poppin' rapper. Oh, no. I mean, when they get to that point, they've kind of already retired, and they're like, oh, what should I do now? Yeah. Because it's like, if people are going to take your music serious, they need mystique. They need like an allure of mystery. They need something that's going to make you not just seem like a guy rapping into a microphone to make money. That is what it is but it's the biggest turnoff to the artist and that's why tory lane's daystar album was such a big deal he didn't do any interviews he didn't talk to anyone he mm-hmm. drops an album and it addresses yep. the majority of things and then people are unpacking it they're listening yeah. to it again mm-hmm. what did he say here and that's an example of he got like a ton of hate right because they're like oh you've got the nerve to do this before speaking but in hindsight, that was the best thing he could have done. Right. And the thing that everyone claims to want their favorite artists to do. If I killed somebody, the No Jumper show the next week would probably be the biggest episode we've ever done. Like, if yeah. I, let's say some scenario where I had to kill somebody in self defense, you know? Oh, absolutely. Now, if I go on DJ Vlad and I go on the sh- on Breakfast Club, if I, if I talk about it 10 times and then I talk about it on my platform, well, we're probably going to get very modest views in comparison and yeah. five years from now if i were to talk about it on dj vlad it's not even going to be a uptick people are gonna be so sick of me hearing me talk about it they're not, they're, they're not even going to click for it right yeah but a lot of these artists they might only have one good interview in them so you better make it count dummy yeah <laughs> <laughs> i don't know all right what, what do you got coming out where are you at what do we need to know about Yasin before we wrap this up? Um, I got an actual big documentary that I'm working on. Ooh. It's uh, it's a little bit inspired by, uh, what's his name? Anthony Bourdain. Okay. That's the most I can say. So if you like the concept of Anthony Bourdain, tune in for it. It might flop, honestly, mm. but it's an artistic thing that I really want to do. And if it does well, then I can turn it into more of a series right. and uh, a show which I would be glad to do. It was a great experience making it. I was working on it like the past, was filming it for like the past six weeks. Nice. So that's pretty much the big thing that I'm working on. That's dope. So you're going to leave the hip hop commentary behind or are you just no, trying to keep related. it interesting? Oh, it is rap. Yeah, right. it is okay. hip hop related. Absolutely. Interesting. That's what's up. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. And I'm sure you'll, you'll be there to let us know if anybody sells 12,000 copies first week. Oh, uh, most likely, yeah, <laughs> perhaps. <laughs> no doubt. All right, everybody go sub to my boy's channel. It was good talking to you, man. I appreciate it. Appreciate the invite. The show. No Jumper, coolest podcast in the world. Check us on YouTube, TikTok, Patreon, Instagram. Like, comment, subscribe. Nojumper.com if you want to support. Appreciate y'all. Peace.